Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! It's Anthony's son, Matteo. No, not really, but I cut my hair and I look so much younger now. So, we are ready to start our 15th lesson, which is not a 15 lesson, it's actually our 16th lesson, because it's uh, lesson number 15, starting from zero. Uh, which I don't have here because it was just an introduction. So I would I should probably also do something like introduction Just to keep track of the fact that we had 16 lessons so far and Hey, good morning everyone says Tiago. Hi. Good morning. So nice to see you and so curious to see the stream manager says zero viewers But it's not true. I see Tiago chatting so probably this means that there are people view watching now i see bobby i see angelo i see tina i see tiago so yeah probably you are here hello Sao, you're there too and i cannot see you in the users in chat for some reason awesome so you are there and uh, just the stream manager just takes a while to to get accustomed to all these users all these watchers that are coming at the same time so, I hope that you digested um, loops, because today we're starting a new topic and we're also going uh, forward with loops too, because loops will never leave us for the rest of our journey. Morning, Bobby. Just with a dot? <laughs> you're, not, you're not excited. Are you sleepy? <laughs> no, just joking. So, we're going to do some functions today. Let's go immediately to the slide uh, that concerns the function and to the tutorial about uh, on JavaScript info about functions. Did you know that we have three different ways to declare functions in JavaScript? Usually in other languages we just have one way or maybe even maybe two ways tops but here we've got three ways and they are all pretty interesting and pretty important so we're going to look at all of them who is ever excited in the morning, worst part of the day, and also in, during Saturday morning, you should be sleeping or playing, and instead you're still here watching me doing business. Okay, so let's do functions. Um, first of all, you already know what a function is because we already used some functions. For example, alert or prompt or confirm are examples of functions. We invoked those functions, we called them, we didn't create those functions, but we use them. Someone created them for us. And now we are able to create our own functions through three different ways. And this is the first one. This is called function declaration. A function declaration is really, really similar to other pieces of code that you saw so far. Maybe it looks like an if, but it's not actually an if. As you can see, it has this new keyword called function, and then you specify a name for the function, and then you open and close a couple of parentheses in which we will put some parameters inside. And then there's a block of code uh, in curly braces in which you can write whatever you want, whatever expressions you want to write. And that's it. So in general, it's just the function keyword, then the name of the function, open parentheses, you put parameters inside, and in curly braces, you put the body of the function. Let's see how it works. So I'm going to create a... Nope. I'm going to create a new file in... A new file in here called 01 function declaration because you want to declare a function just like you declare variables now you are able to declare functions and uh, here I can well I can try the same stuff that he says function this is the new keyword show message which is in camel case because we use camel case for both variables and functions and we open and close a couple of parentheses and we use curly braces to, um, to delimit the body of the function. Bobby says, I do not recall ever using confirm or for of. Um, we used confirm just once, but we preferred prompt because prompt allows you to enter whatever input and then you can parse this input and do whatever you want with it. But with confirm, we used it just 
once for the sake of telling you what was what it was and um, it's just a yes or no which returns a boolean so if you don't remember it I'll show it again to you it's something like confirm do you remember now and this will give me a result and then I can see what the result is about so do you remember now oh yeah okay now the result is a boolean true otherwise I can try again but since I'm declaring a constant is saying no it is already declared so I'm just refreshing the browser and now do you remember now if I say cancel results is false that's it this is a special case of a prompt if you want uh, because it doesn't have a text input it just allows you to click OK or cancel and it'll give you a boolean result which is either true or false of course as any boolean and that's it rehearsal of the uh, prompt uh, of the confirm and um, yes the for of we never saw it it's another kind of loop that I'm not going to show you right now and it pairs with the for in loop for in is a loop that can be applied to objects and for of can be applied to arrays so as soon as I show you what objects are and what arrays are I will also mention the for in and for of loops which are really similar to the loops that we already saw and will in in real life you will probably never use them because usually you use another kind of loop completely different nice haircut by the way says Angelo thanks a lot I was really really scared to have my haircuts in Turin because I usually have it cut in Rome my home city but yeah this guy did a did a good work I, I'm happy with the results so this is how you declare a function function show message which is the name these are optional parameters that we can put but for now let's keep it simple and then here we can write whatever we want so let's do uh, an alert or a console log I, I like I prefer console log so console log hello world and that's it this is how you declare a function and then what do you do with this function well you invoke it as soon as you declare the function you are able to call it by its name and add this couple of parentheses to invoke it so show message as a function declaration tells you how the function should be invoked so with its name and for now with no parameters at all and then when you want to invoke it you know that you should you should call it exactly by its name and give to the function the same amount of parameters that this function expects which in this case is zero because there's no parameters and that's it we can try this function um, I'm going to <coughs> you know I'm going to copy it piece by piece so opening uh, the developer tools copying the function and now just like the fun just as if the function was a variable I'm going to inspect what is the value of show message and I will see that the value of show message is an F with oops <laughs> oh come on it's an F with this description here so as you can see the F suggests that the fact the fact that this is a function um, if I declare a variable like let number is equal to 2 and I inspect the value of number it will just give me the value 2 a function when declared and inspected shows me something slightly different it shows me that it's a function with this uh, with this description of it okay it showed me it shows me exactly what is the value of this function so it's a, a show message function with uh, oh come on with no parameters and with this body here and now if I try to do show message invoking the function by just um, adding a couple of parentheses to the name then I will see the result of this function there is the the result is actually um, we can call it a side effect because the function doesn't do anything at all it doesn't return anything in fact it returns undefined and we'll see what return uh, means but as a side effect it, al it is also printing hello world um, can a variable to be defined declared as a function 
That's, a, as always, a very good question, Angelo, and we can say yes. In fact, that's the second way to declare functions, and it's called function expression, in which you assign a function to a variable. So yes, yes, it's, uh, it is possible, and I'm going to show you right away after we finish with function and declaration. So this is how you declare a function, pretty easy. And now let's make it a little more complicated. Why should I need a function? Well, this example shows you why. One of the reasons why we like to create functions is that once you declare a function, you can, you can invoke it as many times as you wish. So if you want to show the message twice, you can write show message two times and it's going to show the message twice. Or if you want to perform the same operation in loop, you can loop and inside of the loop invoke this function show message. So the function allows you to we say encapsulate, which just means hide all the uh, implementation details on some problem that you are going that you want to solve, and uh, you can reuse these implementation details. So instead of having oh come on, instead of having to copy and paste as we did last Wednesday, for example, to copy and paste a huge block of code, we can put that block of code inside of a function and then invoke that function as many times as we wish. So instead of copy pasting 10 lines of code, we can just copy paste one line of code, which is the function invocation. So this makes functions already really, really useful, but that's not, that's not all of it. Um, functions have the ability to, of course, um, encapsulate anything, including variables. And when you declare variables inside of a function, they are local variables. This is not really new to you because we already saw what, uh, what happens to a variable when you create it inside of a block of code. When the variable is declared inside of a block of code, it's born it's used and it dies inside of the same block of code and it's not accessible from outside of that block of code. When I say block of code, I'm saying anything that is between brackets, uh, curly braces. For example, in a if or in a for loop, whatever you create inside of here, let num is equal to two, will be available only inside of this uh, block of code. If you try to access num from outside, for example, console log num, you will see that num has no value outside of it. It's undefined. Uh, the same applies with um, functions. For, so for example, let's do, uh, let's change this thing into a function. So function space, and I'll give um, a, a name like uh, show two, <laughs> and I declare a variable called num with value two, and now I'm console logging it. Pretty stupid, but this is just to show you how in a function I can declare a local variable, I can use it, and then if I try to use it again outside of the function, I will see that this variable is undefined outside of here. Let's see if it's true. Um, going to refresh everything. So again, uh, I'm going really fast, <laughs> sorry. So I'm going to repeat everything so you have also the time to type with me. Function show2 is a function declaration with a function named show2. It declares inside of it a variable called num, which I'll give a value of two, and I'm showing the value of this number. And then outside of the function, I'm also trying to console log this number. So before doing this, let's just declare the function and the function is there. As you can see, even this statement uh, is returning undefined because there's nothing to return. I just declared a function. And then if I do show two, if I invoke show two, it's going to print two as expected. But if, what if I now try from outside to console log num? It says that num is not defined because num is not defined outside of the scope of this function. It's defined only inside of the scope of this function, okay? 
So this is an important uh, phenomenon that happens in JavaScript and it, well, in, in pretty much every programming language. You have to um, check the scope of the variables. If you want this variable to be accessible from outside, you can, but you have to write things slightly different. You have to declare the variable outside like this. Then you declare the function if you want to show to and then you can assign a value you can do whatever you want to this variable you can uh, change its value you can you can print it and then at the end if you try to also print the value of the number uh, of this variable of this number well since the variable was declared outside in that case you will have access to it and you will see that the number when when you do sh when you invoke show two will have its value changed so let's try also this part here i'm going to copy this on here okay i declared a variable num i declare the function show two now i can uh, console log the number and since i never invoke the function in the first place num is undefined and it's well, it's, it seems like it's returned two times, but it's not. It's not returned twice. It's just that console log prints undefined and then returns undefined, whatever this means. We're going to see what returning things mean uh, in a while. So num, since we never invoked this function before, is there. It is uh, a variable. It, it, it exists, but it's still undefined because I never gave it a value. Now, if I do show two, it's going to print the number two. And if I now try to console log the number again, now I will print the number two because in the meantime, the variable num was changed by uh, this side effect from this function, okay? So I don't think it's uh, very different from what we already saw so far with loops. Um, I hope it makes sense to you. If it doesn't, please tell me. I can try to explain it a little better. I am i don't know if I'm doing a good job right now. Um, okay, so local variables. As you can see here, it's the same thing. Let message is a variable declared inside of the function. And if I'm alerting the message, well, the message will be alerted. If I invoke show message, it will alert the message, of course. But now, if I want to alert the message from outside of the function, well, the message was never declared outside of the scope of this function because this is a local variable. It's local to the body of the function, to this block of code. So outside of it, it's not accessible. It doesn't exist. Instead, if I declare the variable from outside, then I can use it inside of a function and here, for example, it's concatenated with, um, with some other string in order to get another local variable. If I do show message, it will print exactly what I expect. And now, question is, what if I try to print username? What, what, is, what will this thing show? And second, what if I try to print message? What does it show? So that was my question to you. I'm, I'm um, think of it. And in the meantime, I'm going to copy this code. I'm going to change this alert into a console log. I'm going to repeat this thing. I have a variable here called username and it's equal to John. No, it's equal to Anthony because it's my channel. <laughs> and then I declare a function called show message. And inside of the function, there's this local variable called message, which is the result of concatenating hello, the string hello, with the variable username, which is not a local variable because it was defined outside of the function. So I console log the message, and this is a function that I can invoke right away. I'm going to do it. Okay, so it says hello, Anthony, nothing unusual because the variable it should be hello Anthony and it's printed as I expected. But what if I now from outside of the function try to uh, print username and message? I don't know if you got the gist of it, but you can print 
variables that are not local, you cannot print variables that are local to the function because they do not exist outside of the scope of this function. So if I try to do a console log of username, drum roll, Anthony, yes, because it's a variable and I can print a variable, of course. But if I try to do console log message, ah, oh, message is not defined, of course, because message is local to the function. So I can console log message from, the sa from within the same block of code, but I cannot console log the message from outside of the block of code, okay? So there are local variables, and variables that are not so local. <laughs> they can be accessed from outside. I'm not saying global variables for now, but yeah, it's this is also a global variable. Okay. <clears throat> oh, this is probably exactly... No, it's not exactly what I was saying, but almost. And um, yeah, what else we can say? Well, what happens if I now maybe change the value of username. I cannot change the value of message because, as I said, message is a local variable, so I cannot access it. Not reading, not writing, I cannot access this variable. But I can access username. It was declared in the same scope, so I can, for example, change its name. And the name will be the last person that commented, which is Angelo. Okay? So I'm reassigning a new value to username. And now if I invoke the function show message again, it says hello Angelo, because the function takes whatever is the current value of username. The current value of username was Anthony before, but then if I change the current value of username, and when I invoke the function, it will rerun all the code that is inside of it. So it's, it will create the new variable message, which was created, used, and destroyed a while ago. And now it's recreating it once again by concatenating the string hello with the current value of username that in the meantime changed. And so it's going to console log hello Angelo, not a hello Anthony. Okay? This is not how you want to write functions, however, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there's a paragraph here about global variables, and um, I'm not really sure that it's important right now, but every variable that you type on the developer tools of Chrome is a global variable. And I already mentioned this. Uh, global variables means that there is some something called window in here and the window is well an object and we will see what objects are but window is an object that represents the current browser window and the window has lots of different properties that you can look at lots of different properties among which we should see also the properties that we created for example I don't know if we can see window window dot user name. No, it's undefined. Okay, they changed some stuff in the meantime. I think it should have been uh, oh for maybe yeah maybe because I declared it with let and uh, okay. There are there's this problem in uh, in JavaScript about global variables. So if I for example um, create a variable uh, my var and assign it a value like uh, hello there. And as you can see, I'm forgetting to use the keyword let or the keyword const. Or maybe I can even use var in this case. Well, if I forget to write let or const, or if I use var, I think, the variable will still be declared but it's declared in a different way. It's declared as a global variable, which means that you remember the window object? I think, if nothing changed in the meantime, that the window object will now have a variable attached to it, a property called hello there. So this means that uh, I, I have changed 
somehow the behavior of my browser window because I attached a new thing that wasn't there before. And this is nothing, uh, nothing big. This is not uh, a problem, but it becomes a problem when you start overriding things that are already there. For example, I already told you probably that window dot dollar means something here. And if I say dollar is equal to uh, overridden, now window dot dollar is, oops, is wrong because I, I typed it wrong. Uh, the, I have, still have problems with the W key. So window dot dollar is now overridden which means that I had some feature on the window and I completely wiped out replacing it with my thing. And this is a problem with global variables. Global variables are variables that um, are in the scope of the whole browser window. And I have to keep, uh, to pay a lot of attention to these global variables because I could uh, maybe overwrite something that I wasn't supposed to overwrite. So global variables is one of the most important problems that we always had in JavaScript. And global variables are addressed in multiple ways. One of them is by, for example, declaring variables with the let keyword. Because if you declare variables with the let keyword, this variable will not be global. It will always be local. So I told you already that let and const are two new keywords that were introduced in JavaScript. We had var, but we don't like var anymore because var was buggy. It introduced many bad things like global scoping, global variables. And instead, we prefer to use let and const because they overcome this problem of global variables. And it's not the only reason why we use let and const instead of var, but let's keep it like this for now. So we want to avoid global variables and functions are a really good way to avoid global variables. Let's say that for some reasons, uh, for some reason you have to, to use var. Uh, this is quite stupid and uh, probably not relevant anymore. But if you say var name is equal to, um, who else wrote? Bobby, Sao, Angelo, Tiago. The first one who commented, Tiago. Var name is Tiago. If this is a global variable and I want to print it on the console log, but then I don't want this variable to uh, dangle there as a global variable. I just want it to be local and then use it and then forget about it. Well, functions are a very good way to prevent these variables to be global. In fact, I can, I can put all this code inside of a function, which is very difficult to do in the uh, in the developer tools. So I can put everything inside of a function. I can invoke this function. And now I achieve the same result that I wanted. So I printed Tiago, but the name variable <laughs> is a different one. Why is it a different one? Because there is a global variable called window.name, which I prevented overriding. So just by encapsulating all of my code inside of a function and then invoking that function, I was able to write the code that I wanted to write without overriding any global variables. So this is really important. And it's so important that uh, nowadays it's not really that relevant, but in, uh, in earlier days, and you could probably find this thing in, uh, in old code bases, we used to use something called an IIFE. IIFE means immediately invoked function expression. And it's a very strange thing. JavaScript is full of hacks. And the hack is something like this. I'm going to show you what this is about. So, I said that I want to declare a function and I want to execute it immediately after because I just want to write this piece of code uh, but making sure that any variables that I declared inside do not become global variables. So at a certain point, someone really smart, of course not me, 
decided that they could do this function declaration and function invoking, function execution, in the same, uh, on the same run. Angelo says, I didn't understand. Why is my var is equal to hello working without variable declaration when for us it's always showed error undefined variable when we forgot declaring a variable? Okay, where did you get the error undefined variable? Maybe it was on Node.js. Let's see. So if I go to Node.js and I declare a variable called, for example, my awesome var is equal to hey this didn't actually give me an error i have my awesome var declared some, somewhere in node i don't have the window object because there's no window in node.js but i think we've got something else maybe it's called root no not even um what's it called in node it's called module Probably, but I don't see the variable here, so probably it's not here. So what is the, let me see, root object in node. What is the root object in node? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's called global, of course. No, maybe not. Yeah, root, global. Okay, it should be gl global. Let's see. What is global? Yes, it's something that contains a lot of stuff. And it also contains my awesome var. So I can declare variables without using the var or the let or the const keyword when I'm writing code inside of Node.js and when I'm also on the browser window. I proved it right now. Now, let's do another thing. I'm going to create a new file right away here. Nano, because you know what is Nano. So I'm going to use uh, a terminal editor. Nano script.js. This way I can create a new text file and write inside of it. And I say my var is equal to this should not work. I don't know if it works. Let's save it with control O, quit with control X, and now I'm going to node script.js. So I'm going to execute the script. Is it going to work? Yes, it doesn't give me any error. I declared a variable, I'm not even using it. So in fact, I should use it somehow. For example, I should console log my var so I can see what happens. Otherwise, I'm not really sure that anything happens at all. Yeah, this should not work, but it does. In fact, you can declare a variable without using the var, let, or const statement. But let's see if we use use strict. You remember this? I mentioned it, just a glimpse of it. But if you add this string, because it's a string of text, if you add this string at the top of the, of the file, well, this makes the JavaScript interpreter a little stricter. So it will complain if there's something that uh, the JavaScript interpreter doesn't like. For example, it should complain if the variable was never declared. Yup, you see, my var is not defined. And because we asked the JavaScript interpreter to be strict. If it's not strict, my var not declared means it's actually a declaration and it's a global variable declaration. But in strict mode, this variable will not be declared. It, it just give me give you error. Ah, sorry, I confused something. Just woke up. Maybe I should think first. No, no, please, please tell me all this stuff. Um, you probably thought about another problem, which was something like, I don't know, maybe if you declare the constant and then you try to change its value. Um, let's say that this should not work, but this should work actually. Okay. And even if we are not in strict mode, I'm pretty sure that this works. Yeah it, yeah, it gives you an error because if you declare a constant, you cannot assign uh, the constant uh, again. And what happens if it's a let and you redeclare it? This is also another problem. You don't want to redeclare a variable. You just want to assign a new value to the same variable. What happens if you redeclare the variable? Still an error, even if we are not in strict mode. 
okay? And that's it for Node. And the same goes with, uh, with, the, with the browser window, even though here we have slightly different stuff. So, as I was saying, the fact that you can place any piece of code inside of a function and then invoke it just for the sake of not having global variables is, was so useful that at a certain point someone invented the IIFE, immediately invoked function expression expression immediately invoked function expression what does it mean it means that you can declare this function just like this and then you put it in a couple of parentheses oh okay you could you put it in a couple of parentheses oh this should be open okay and uh, and then you add another couple of parentheses just to say that this is a function and you want to invoke it right away what happens it just works in the same expression you could even i don't recommend it of course but but you could you could even put all of this in the same line for for some reason so this is actually one one statement one whole huge long statement and this is exactly the same as saying declare a variable called, Tiago, uh, called name with the value of Tiago, console log this name, but prevent at all costs to uh, leak variables and functions that would become global. And um, if you see the syntax of the IIFE, you can see that there's not even a function name. In fact, I didn't tell you, um, but you can even create anonymous functions. So functions that have no name. Sometimes it's useful and we will see when and how. And in this case, for example, we don't care about giving a name to the function because we are never referring to this name. We are just declaring the function and executing it right away. So we don't need a name. We need a name in, in, instead if we want to split the declaration and the invocation into different times. Or if, if we want to reuse the function multiple times, then in that case, we'll give the function a name and then we invoke it by name. One, two, multiple, multiple times. In this case, we don't need a name and we can just remove the name. It's an anonymous function. It's a function with no name that we declare and execute right away. This is an IIFE. You know what? I'm going to put this in my portfolio so you will have a reference to it. E-I-I-F-E, -I -I -E, which, which means immediately invoked function expression. So now that you see how it works, you can also understand this acronym. It's, a it's an expression that declares a function and immediately invokes it as soon as it's uh, in, as, as soon as it's defined Sao says in the example let message is equal to hello plus username it's possible that a variable defined outside of a function has the same name as a local variable inside of a function what happens that's a beautiful question in fact this is exactly what i wanted to show you and i was about to forget it so really thank you for this uh, for this question so i have my variable um, which is sao, and then I've got a function called print variable, in which I declare another my variable which has the same name, but in this case the name will be who's left Bobby. And now I want to console log this. And also I want to console log outside. I can do it because there is a variable called my variable outside of the scope of the function. So let's see again. Uh, maybe I should put some spaces so you don't confuse the code with the other bits of code that we other examples. So let my variable is equal to cell. This is a variable that has a scope outside of the function. But then I'm redeclaring the same variable inside of the function scope. And I'm console logging this variable in the function and outside of it and i'm going to also print the variable and maybe also do another console log just to check if the variable in the meantime changed let's see what happens so i'm going to do this 
Okay, this is the declaration of the variable and declaration of the function. So nothing is executing right now. Now I want to console log my variable. And as you would expect, not console log, console log. As you would expect, the variable that is printed is the variable that is declared outside because it's the only one that's visible to this console log. This other variable is not visible. Now, if I print variable, it prints Bobby. Why does it print Bobby? Because it declares a local variable whose name is Bobby, and it's going to print that variable. Does this mean that the internal declaration will affect somehow the external declaration? Let's do a console log of my variable again to see if this uh, outer variable changed somehow. And it didn't, okay? So, the fact that you are using a function allows you to redeclare multiple times variables with the same name because they belong to completely different scopes. The only drawback on this is that if you want to access the outer variable from inside of here, well, you cannot because you have already a variable that has this name. So if I try to do something like, let's say, let's my variable here is Bobby plus my variable that comes from outside. Well, I cannot do this because my variable in the scope of this function has only one meaning and it's this variable here. It's not going to take the value of the outer scope. I'm really sure, I'm really hope that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm right on this. Let's see. What if I say print variable? Yeah, you can see it's, uh, it gives me an error because if you look at only what it's inside of this function, it says that you are declaring a local variable called my variable, which is the result of concatenating Bobby and inside of the function, my variable, which doesn't exist yet because you are starting to declare it right now. So there's no way if you have two variables with the same name in different scopes to use them uh, together. If you really want to use them together, just change the name of one of the two. This could be my outer variable and the other one could be my inner variable. So my outer variable, and you can use it here because this way there's no, uh, there's no misunderstanding. My outer variable, ah, my outer variable is only, oh, I did it also here. Uh, my outer variable is only this variable that you have outside. Well, my variable, which we can call my inner variable if you want to, well, this is only this variable here. So print variable, it's going to work like Bobby Sao. And this should give you no problems at all. In fact, it's the, probably the first or second example we saw. Um, no, I removed it. So I'm going to copy it here. Okay, we had an example in which we had an outer variable and an inner variable, and we can, we can change them. And we can also see that if I do a console log of my outer variable, this will give me the value of the outer variable. If I print the variable, ah, then it's just going to print the value of my inner variable, which is the result of concatenating some uh, internal string with some external variable. And then if I console log my outer variable again, I will see that it was not changed. In this case, sometimes you can change it. For example, inside of this code, you can do something like uh, my outer variable is equal to Tina, which is not writing, but I saw her among the watchers, so I hope she's there. Okay, so if I also change the value of my outer variable, then yes, when I print my outer variable, it will be changed from Sal to Tina. If I instead declare, I just need to add four characters on this line and it behaves completely different. In this case, I declared a local variable, 
that is called my auto variable, but this name is misleading because this is actually a local variable. It's an inner variable that has nothing to do with this other variable. In fact, this code is about to break because if I declare a variable like this one, it means that this other variable, my auto variable, is probably referring to this other variable that is inside. So it's not referring anymore to the outer variable. So this is undeclared. It's probably break, going to break because of an undeclared variable. Let's see if it's true. And if I do print variable, boom, my outer variable could not be accessed before initialization. Why? It is initialized. It's initialized here. No, because if you add the declaration of the same variable here, it means that this variable was completely hidden by this other variable declaration, which is inside, and it's declared after it was used. And you cannot use it after, uh, you cannot declare it after it was used. You can declare it before. So if I can, uh, if I put it this on the first line of the function block. In that case, yes, I can do this. Uh, print variable again. And now it says, Bo it says Bobby Tina, not Bobby Sal, because this local variable uh, somehow uh, hid, hid, hid the global variable that you see here. So yeah, uh, as you can see, naming variables is really important for multiple reasons, for clarity, but also because if you don't pay attention, you could maybe even override or hide other variables now that we are starting to think in scopes. Okay, then what do we have here? Okay, let's go with uh, some more complex functions because these functions are pretty stupid. You can add parameters to functions and you know this already because sometimes you already uh, invoked some functions with parameters. For example, console log. Well, log is a function that usually requires at least one, parameters for, uh, one parameter. For example, hello. Little did you know, you can even pass multiple parameters. For example, if you also pass world, Console log is so smart that it's going to concatenate every parameter that you give it and create a whole string. This is just a specialty of console log. In fact, if you try to do the same with alert, with hello and also world, it's not going to work. It's going to just say hello and it's going to ignore the second parameter because alert is a function that must be invoked with just one parameter. But there are some functions that require multiple parameters. For example, um, prompt. Prompt, as we saw, um, uh, requires a question. And optionally, you can also have a default value as a second parameter. These are functions that are being invoked with parameters. So question with default value inside of it. And some of you also inspected a little bit on uh, some uh, functions in maths. So you can have something like math dot, uh, well, math dot floor requires only one parameter. You can give it, I don't know, a number like 3.14 and it will give you the floor of 3.14, which is the, the closest integer, uh, which, is, which is lower than the current number whereas seal will give you the nearest. Oh, there's a problem with OBS. Still there? Let me, let me know when everything is uh, working correctly again. We had technical problems because why not? It's so good to have technical problems. Just checking if uh, you guys are there again. Is anybody home? Anybody in the house? Whoop, whoop. Uh, I think it's working again. Okay, thanks, Angelo. Awesome. So I was saying that there are functions that uh, accept 
one parameter or two parameters or even uh, a random number of parameters in fact console log you can give it as many parameters as you want seal and floor and also round from math accept only one parameter if you add any other parameter here it doesn't do anything at all um, whereas other mathematical functions for example the pow which gives you the power uh, of uh, one number with an exponent. As you can see, there's also a suggestion here. Pow is a function that accepts an X and a Y. So if I say two and three as parameters, this is two to the power of three, which gives you eight, because two to the powers of three, to the power of three means two times two times two, three times. <laughs> times two not times t okay uh three times one two and three so as you can see there are functions that can be invoked with one parameter with two parameters or even with uh, any number of parameters and how do you do that well you have to declare these functions and give what we call a signature a signature means we define the name of the function the parameters that it accepts and also its return value which we haven't seen yet but let's look at parameters before so how do we do this pretty easy um, I want to say function say say hello and now this function also accepts a parameter and the parameter is uh, can it can have any name for example let's say who say hello to who and this will console log um, let's do a template literal. Hello, who? Oh, come on. Okay. This is a function that accepts a generic parameter called who, but I could call it x and it will be exactly the same. The important thing is that this name is exactly the same name that I'm going to use then in my block of code. So, function say hello accepts one parameter right now and I can declare a variable called name for example and I will say the name is world and then I can invoke say hello by giving it the name and this is usually something that some people mess up as you can see we don't need an exact match between the formal parameter that we declare when declaring the function with the parameter the actual parameter that we are using this is saying say hello given some who and this is actually invoking say hello with any variable that i care about this could also be not a variable this could be just the string itself without the variable i can place whatever i want here but whatever i place in here will be treated as a who inside of the function. It's like saying, uh, I don't know, if I have a function sum of x and y, it will probably print these two numbers sum together, x plus y, but this does not mean that I have to invoke the function with two parameters called exactly x and y. You can call them as you wish, or you can even not call them. You can say sum of two and three. Let's try these experiments on the, on the developer tools. So I'm going to declare this function, say hello. I'm probably running a lot, so please tell me if you want me to slow down. Say hello to who? Now, if I want to... Uh, to, to invoke this function, I just need to invoke it exactly as before, but now I can specify the actual parameter that I want to give it. For example, world. Hello world. Or I can say hello, let's say hello to everybody who's chatting in the, uh, in the Twitch chat. So first of all, Tiago. Hello Tiago. Then we have um, Sao. Hello Sao. And uh, Angelo, say hello Angelo, and Bobby, I think that we are all there, in the order that you appeared, 
okay? In, the order, in order of appearance. So as you can see, the cool thing about functions when you add parameters is that the same code will work regardless of the parameter you give. And now this code that you are creating can be parameterized. It can be dynamic. It doesn't do only one thing. It does multiple things depending on the parameters that you give, that you pass it. Uh, what happens if you use say hello with no parameters? Well, in that case, if you pass no parameters, there is a parameter, but it's undefined. So it says hello undefined. This is exactly the same as saying hello undefined. Okay, because the function expects at least, well, one parameter. And if you don't pass that parameter, then it's going to create this local variable, this local parameter called who, but with a value of undefined. And uh, what happens if you instead use two parameters? Angelo says, I just checked and it seems like you have to put the world into quotes because otherwise the function would expect a variable. Okay, yeah, good, good thing. So, as you saw, I said say hello with all your names in single quotes. And this is fine, but it's not supposed to be always like that. You can declare a variable, for example, let name is equal to Angelo. And then you can say hello to that variable because the variable holds the string so this is going to work if you say hello with the string name it will say hello name because this is the value uh, that we passed this is the string name so this is more of a matter of uh, variables and their values more than uh, than, pro than a new thing about functions uh, you either pass a value like this string or you pass the name a reference to a variable which stores a value so it's going to use that value stored in that variable hope it makes sense um yeah i think so um let's let's try um let's try an example with two parameters for example this is my function sum x given x and y as you can see the parameters are separated with commas this is really important you cannot say x space y or x call semicolon y it's comma you separate all these parameters through um through commas and if you want to a, a third parameter you just say like this comma z and then you do i don't know x y and z okay so this is a sum between three numbers and if I want to use it, I say sum of, and I have to pass at least, well, three parameters, exactly three parameters. So I'm summing two with three and five and see what happens. It's going to print 10. What if I pass only two parameters? Probably you understood this, but if I don't pass the third parameter, the third parameter will be undefined. So it's going to sum two, three and undefined, which is none because you cannot sum anything with undefined. If you do one plus undefined, it's going to give you none. Whatever number with undefined is none. And this is a strange thing that happens with, uh, with JavaScript because you know that the plus symbol is overloaded. So in fact, the sum could also be performed bet between strings. If you do two plus the string three plus the string five, it's actually going to concatenate those strings, those strings instead of summing them. It's, this is nothing new to you, of course, right? Uh, you can just look at the fact that we are passing things and this operation, this expression is being performed on these things. So you can do something like, uh, let's sum a number two with the string three and the number five what happens is still two, three, five, because as you know, a number plus a string is not a sum. It's a concatenation between two strings. And once we have one string concatenated with a number, it's still a string. So it's all the same stuff, but now we are using functions. And now we can use also variables like a, which is two, let b, which is three, let's see which is five 
and I can sum the values of these variables by just giving a reference to these variables. Let's, uh, let's sum a, b, and c, whatever var value is stored in these variables. And it will give me 10, of course, just like when we, are sum we were summing uh, the values 2, 3, and 5. Angelo says, could you do sum of 2 and parse int variable name and 5? Yes, why not? Let's do this. And I'm pretty sure it will work. So uh, let's create a variable, uh, my string, and my string is 3, the string 3. So now what Angelo suggests is to um, nest function invocations together. So I'm going to do a sum of 2 of something new and 5. And this something new is instead of just using my string, which is actually uh, a string, so I'm, I, want, I want this to be a sum, and I don't want this to be a concatenation. So what I can do is to first parse the string as an integer, like this, or by using number, or even by using this trick of uh, placing a plus before everything. Let's do parse int as Angelo suggested. Yes, it's still 10, because this thing is actually the same as saying, first of all, parse the string as an integer, and then, and then do the sum of two, and whatever was the outcome of this, and five. Bobby, can the function parameter be user-defined, like prompt how many numbers you wish to sum, and then adding their input as a parameter? Yes, you can, but for that, you need a new operator, which I haven't explained yet. It's called the spread operator. If you want a glimpse on that, no, I'm not going to give you a glimpse on that because the spread operator requires some knowledge about arrays. So I'm sorry for that. But yes, you can. And in fact, this is exactly what happens with console log. In console log, the, uh, the strange thing is that you can pass any number of parameters you want. And if you look here at the signature of the console log, it doesn't just give you f of one parameter or two parameter, it's giving you f of dot 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 data. This dot 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 is actually an operator that we are going to inspect uh, in future lessons, and it's the spread operator. So any data you put will be spread inside of the parameter list and can be used in even iterating over these parameters. So, oh, wait a second. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you cannot, you cannot do more than that. You, for now, we cannot sum any number of numbers, for now. But you will see, later on, we will do it. What else? These are the parameters. And we can also, let's see... Okay, I think that this is already really important, so I, I don't know if it's telling you... Yeah, let, let's see it. Um, so, if you have parameters, what is the difference between having parameters passed to the sum, to the sum function, or to just use some outer variable that can still be used inside... Well, not in this case. Um, some outer variable that you can still use inside of the function. Is there any difference between using an external variable and having no parameters rather than using parameters and not using external variables? So let's find out. Let's see if there is a difference between the two. Uh, I'm going to create another function called sum, which is not going to use any parameters at all, but it's still going to console log the value of x and y if they exist. So if I now use this, um, let me refresh everything. So I've got a function sum, which is console logging x and y, even if x and y do not exist. If I now invoke sum, it's going to break because x was not defined. But now let's define those variables. Let x is equal to 2 and let y is equal to 3. And what happens if I now invoke sum? Yes, now it works. And what if I say now that x is equal to 4? If I invoke sum again, sum is going to tell me 4 and 3. Uh, 
I'm stupid because I'm not summing the numbers. I was just printing them one next to the other. I forgot to say plus. Sorry. Uh, I hope that this is not... I'm so tired. Um, let's try again. Sum is going to be invoked with no parameters and it's going to break. Now, I'm declaring x equal to 2 and y is equal to 3 and now these external variables can be accessed from inside this function so sum without parameters will give me 5 and if I change the value of one of the variables let's say that y is now 6 then now sum changes its behavior okay um, let's do another thing Let's do another thing, which is changing the value of x. x will be also incremented by 1 before summing, for some reason. So, sum is not actually summing. This is more of a increment, increment and sum. Well, increment only the first one. Uh, let's increment both. Who cares? Okay, this is going to increment both variables and then it's going to sum them together. Let's see what happens. Uh, refreshing everything, defining this variable, this function. I'm going to invoke it with no parameters and it's going to break. But now I can let x equal to 2 and let y is equal to 3. And now if I try to increment and sum again, I will see 7 because 2 was increased by 1 when it was incremented by 1 3 was incremented by 1 so this means that I'm summing 3 and 4 which in fact gives me 7 and what happens in the meantime to x x was changed from within the function and its new value is 3 and the same goes with y y changed its value from inside of the function and now its new value is 4 um, Angelo says, could we just go slightly so slower so we can copy? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, of course we can. So I'm going to show you this part of here. Uh, and I'll give you the time to copy. In the meantime, I'm going to just rehearse things. So what were you, are we doing now? We are experimenting on how functions work, on how functions function. And we see that although the syntax is very simple, we just have this new keyword function, then give a name, a couple of parentheses, uh, a couple of curly braces, and then you can write whatever you want in it. Well, actually, there's more to it. So this is one of those lessons in which the syntax is pretty easy, but you have to uh, train yourselves on uh, how you can use these, uh, this new construct to solve your problems and how using this uh, construct badly can go on, uh, on your way. So right now I'm trying to see the difference between one function that accepts parameters and a function that doesn't accept parameters but uses some variables that are declared from outside of the scope somewhere. To make these two equal, I should also do something like, let's do an increment and sum here too. And I'm going to do exactly the same. I could copy and paste, but I'm not used to copy and paste. I want to write everything. Okay, <laughs> it was better copy and pasting. Okay, these two functions seem pretty pretty similar. I'm also going to invoke 2 and 3 here and see what happens. Oh, stupid. Uh, sum cannot be... Uh, if I put 2 and 3 here, they will not be used because here increment sum doesn't ask for any parameter at all. So these are two functions that behave almost exactly the same. One accepts parameters, it increments the parameters and sums them. And I can invoke it by passing two actual parameters, 2 and 3. Or I can declare let x is equal to 2, let y is equal to 3, and just pass these two values here. This second function instead uh, doesn't access, uh, accept any parameter, and as we saw, it will break if we don't specify x and y. So we have to declare x is equal to 2 
and y is equal to 3, otherwise this function will never work. Just to make things, uh, I'm sorry, I told you that I was going to slow down instead of changing my code uh, even faster. Uh, but I just want to make everything looks the same shape. And now I'm stopping, really, for, 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 for real. These are the two things that I wanted to show. So the first function is increment and sum given two parameters. The two parameters are incremented and I'm logging them. And then I'm declaring two variables. I could not also declare these variables, but I'm going to. And then I'm going to invoke increment and sum with, the, with a reference to these two variables. In the second case, it's exactly the same, but I'm not specifying the parameters. The body of the function is exactly the same, but I'm not accessing, accepting parameters. And now I'm declaring the two variables x and y, which must be called x and y, because this is the name that they have inside of the function. Whereas here, I can give any name I want. I'm going to do it and, uh, and, uh, and, and go back. I can call this a, and this is fine. I can give it the name that I want, because still, when I'm using this function, this variable a will be treated as an x, as a generic x. But still, in this case, let's use the same name. I hope that I was clear. <laughs> Not too much. I don't think I'm doing a good work today, but uh, I'll try to be better. Okay. So, I'm going to try the first thing. So, here we've got the first function, which accepts parameters. And I'm already starting to define the two variables that I want to pass to this function. So, I'm going to increment and sum variable x and variable y. As always, these two, x and y, refer to this variable here, not these two parameters inside. Yes, these x will be mapped to the, to the parameter called x inside of it, but the value of x is 2, is whatever is the value of this variable that we are passing to the function. And if I do this, it will give me 7. But also, let's see what happens if I now inspect the value of x. It is still 2, and the value of y is still 3. What? So, what happens here? Well, the cool thing about functions with parameters is that, at least for now, let's say that all the values that we pass inside of these uh, functions are copied and stored locally, as they, as they were local variables. So, if I pass 2, this x is now a local variable with a value of 2 that gets incremented by 1, it gets summed with y, and then since it's a local variable, it's, it's born, it's used, and it dies inside of the scope of this function. While the outer x that we have here is not affected because we made a copy of it. So as you can see, x stayed 2, even if we internally inside of the function incremented the value. And this is a cool feature of functions. Let's see what happens instead if we don't use parameters. So in this second instance, we have a function that doesn't need any parameters. It uses some x or y uh, taken from outside if they are there. And now if I increment and sum with no parameters, it still gives me 7, but if I inspect the value of x, it's 3. It's, if I inspect the value of y, it's 4, which means that as a side effect, this function changed my initial variables. These are two very different phenomenons, not changing the variables that I'm passing and changing the variables that I'm passing. And I can say for sure that you prefer the function with parameters because it doesn't change the outer variables. Uh, if you want to change these outer variables, there is another way to do it, and it should never be as a side effect. You don't have control. You have a function, and you don't even, if you see 
the function from outside, if you don't know how the function is created inside, well, you don't even know how many uh, variable it needs. Uh, you don't know what is the name of the variables that this function needs. If you don't declare a variable called x and a variable called y, then increment sum will always fail. Let's try. I'm declaring again this, but now I'm going to use a and b instead of x and y. If I now increment and sum, this is not going to work, because increment and sum implicitly expected a variable called x and a variable called y. And it's not working, because x and y were never defined. Instead, if we use this other way of writing functions with parameters, then I can declare a and b, and I can call increment sum knowing that this function requires two parameters, a parameter x and a parameter y, but I also know, because this is how functions with parameters work, that I can pass any value or even any variable provided that it's a number in this case. So I can pass A and B and this thing will work because A and B will be somehow mapped to the formal parameters X and Y, which will store a copy of the variable that we passed. So this is going to work and it gives me some more information on how to invoke this function. This function just is, is much better because it's more reliable. It's more predictable and it doesn't change as a side effect the initial values of a and b which is probably a good thing usually it is a good thing to not have my external variables changed affected somehow as a side effect by some function all right hope it's fine I want to add one, one small thing to this, which is default values. So what happens if in your function called sum, you have X and Y, but the user doesn't provide those numbers. You want to console log X plus Y but maybe the user is going to call to invoke sum, not with two or three, which is correct, but he's going to invoke, or she, is going to invoke with just two, or even nothing. Uh, the user can do it. Uh, you cannot prevent whoever uses your function to call it in an improper way. Well, in that case, we have to do some uh, input validation, let's say. We have to provide maybe a default value in case one of the values is undefined. For example, here the two values are 2 and 3. Here the two values are 2 and undefined, as you know, because if I don't pass a value, then this value exists, but it's undefined. And here both values are undefined. Of course, we can have also undefined n3, and this makes everything Wait a sec. Okay, now we have we covered every possible situation, I think. So we forgot both parameters defined, only the first one defined, only the second one defined, none of them defined. So how do we do input validation? Well, in early days, we used to use some ifs. If x is undefined, then let's say that x is zero, for example because I don't want to sum undefined things. If uh, you don't pass me a valid value, I'm just going to say it's zero. And the same goes with uh, the other if. If y is undefined, then I'm going to say that y is zero. And this is already a good input validation. It's a way to make my sum work in any case. I know I went very fast in here too. <laughs> And that's also why I insisted a lot uh, during lessons zero and one 
to practice on your keyboard skills. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is your fault if I'm too fast. Uh, this is my fault. But in order to overcome this problem, um, I'm uh, recommending you to practice a little on your keyboard skills. So I can try to slow down and you can try also to, okay, to, to, to be a little faster for me. This way we will meet in the middle. So the function sum now is exactly the same as any function, but now it has some uh, control on the input. If any of x or y is undefined, I'm going to provide a default value, which is just the number zero, if I want to. Or you can be as creative as possible. You can maybe, um, you can say x is the conversion into number of x as you are always done so far. But you know what? I actually don't remember what happens if I convert to number the value of undefined. It's still none, so no, uh, it's not going to work. I still need to do something like this. So in early days, we had to do this. If x is undefined, I will put a value of zero. If y is undefined, I will put a value of zero. And let's see what happens. I'm going to uh, copy the function declaration and all its invocations and we'll see what is the outcome. Three, two, one, go. So the first one gives me five, because two plus three is five. The second one gives me two, so the second parameter was actually turned into a zero. The third one gives me three, because the first parameter undefined was turned into a zero, so it just gives me zero plus three, which is three. And the fourth, one is giving me zero because both parameters were undefined so they were turned both to zero and zero plus zero is zero so this sum is cool because it's working even if the values are undefined but maybe these values can also have other values there's not just undefined there's also null and if it's also null uh, i have to say something like or x is null and I can do this here, too. And x could also be a string. It could be an empty string. So maybe I have to also check if it's an empty string. Oh, this is getting pretty, pretty tedious and boring. Of course, uh, you are not forced to do all of this. If you want to check if the variable is undefined or null or an empty string, then in that case you could use the fact that an x like this is a falsy value so you can just say something like if not x because it, it has exactly the same uh, the same meaning angelo says you wrote x equal 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 null and um, and uh, s s quote in the y if thanks a lot yes you're right I'm sorry. Yeah, I went too fast. Yeah, probably I should slow down. So yes, of course, I had to put the Y here. Otherwise, it's uh, no use. So if I have to check for undefined, for null or for empty string, then I can say that this is a falsy value and I can just use if not X. Uh, but we could have other situations. So I am going to recopy all of this. And I'm going to do x, x, and x. What if I don't care about the empty string? Well, in that case, x is equal to undefined or x is equal to null can be written as just one equal, uh, one double equal on null. Because as you already know, x equal equal, not strictly, to null catches both situations, which is x is undefined and x is null. So this is slightly better. And if I only care about the undefined, then this is the new thing. I can use a, f a new feature of functions. And when I say new feature, it means that it's uh, probably four or five years old already. So it's not really that new. But the new feature is default parameters. I can just say x equals zero. When I say x equals zero in the list of parameters, I'm saying that I expect an x, but if x is undefined, 
I will default it to zero. But only in the case if it's undefined. So if x is null, it will still be considered as null. I'm going to sum null and y. If it's an empty string, it will not be converted into a zero. It will be an empty string and I will concatenate the empty string with y. So default parameters are a way to make things way shorter because if I just care about the undefined, I can just, I can just do this x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0, and this will make my code work as before. Because I was just checking for undefined values. Let's just remove all this. You see, sum with, equal, with x that by default equals 0, and y that by default is assigned the value 0, will just work exactly the same when I give undefined values. But it's not the case when I use null values, for example. Null is not undefined. It's a different thing. Null is a value. It's not undefined. It is a value, but it's a null value. It's no value at all. It's not even zero. And in that case, uh, it's still going to work. Why is that? Because if I sum null and three, it's still going to work. So the reason why this is working is just because if you sum null to any number, null will be automatically converted into a number. And what if I try to sum both nulls? Again, it's going to give me zero, which is fine. That's fine. And what if I start using other types like empty string and three? Well, in that case, it's going to be a concatenation. This is not the number three. As you can see, it's black, while numbers are usually uh, seen as, as blue. So this is a concatenation between the empty string and three. If I want to prevent the usage of empty strings, I have to control this input somehow. I have to do something like, I don't know, if the type of x is string because you know that you can inspect the type of a variable if i say type of three is number type of the string three is string so i can check if this is a string and if it's a string then maybe i can try to convert it into a number and there's no shortcut for that i have to write it explicitly like this and the same goes of course with y so if type of y is now a string, I can do a conversion, an explicit conversion from y to its number, numeric value. Let's try this one. I'm going to sum the string 2 and the string 3, so both of them. And it gives me 5. And if I say let A is equal to the string 2, let B is equal to the string 3, and then I'm going to sum A and B, it's giving me 5, and it didn't affect the value of A and B. It didn't change with the conversion, the value of A and B. It just copied the value of A into the X and converted the X without affecting the outer variable. This makes it way more reliable, way more predictive. It doesn't do anything under the hood that I cannot control. So that's why I prefer functions that accept parameters because they copy the value and do any, any calculations on those copies without affecting uh, the outside world. So this is for default values. Actually, the tutorial says a lot more than that. Um, as you can see, default value is like this, text, and if you don't provide a text, it's un if it's undefined, you can provide a default value, even for strings or for whatever you want. You can do strange things such as invoking a function or passing any outer parameter or something like that. We don't really care about this. Uh, of course, if you want to make it more explicit, you can say if text is undefined, then text is empty message, which is exactly what we first started doing. And this gives you a little more control. In fact, for example, you could use something like this. The text is the text itself or empty. What does this mean? Well, 
we are using the falsiness of the text. So if the text is undefined, or if the text is null, or if the text is an empty string, putting this into a Boolean expression makes it turn into a Boolean value. And since this is a falsy value, then we will see the right hand of the expression and the f final value of text will be this string here. So this is one of those uh, hacky shortcuts to do input validation uh, by leveraging Boolean algebra instead of using if, else, etc, etc. So if you want to write this explicitly, it's something like the same thing that we've done before. If the, if the x is undefined, oh, come on, is undefined, or x is null, or x is an empty string, or we can say x is zero because that's another falsy value. And probably there's also other falsy value that I don't have in mind. But in that case, I want x to be, for example, the default value of zero. I can write all of this or I can, uh, uh, I can take advantage of the falsiness that we have in uh, JavaScript and say just that x is itself if x is truthy. So it's not undefined, it's not null, it's not an empty string, it's not zero. If it's a valid value, then it's truthy. Otherwise, I'm going to use another value as default, for example, zero. So this thing here is exactly the same as all this code here. And it's way less verbose. So if you want to check for just undefined, use default values. If you want to check for truthiness or falsiness, you can use the or. There's also another thing that you can do, which is using the nullish coalescing operator. This is something that I barely mentioned because it's a really new addition. I never used it in my own life. I'm, I'm, I didn't get used to it uh, currently, but maybe one day I, would, I will get used to it. And the nullish coalescing operator, if we have a look at it again, will grab only nulls and undefined in a similar way and it's going to completely uh, ignore other kind of falsy values such as empty strings or zero. So for example if we want to check if this value is undefined or null and only these values and in that case we want to give zero we have to write either if x is undefined or x is null, then in that case do x equal to zero. Or we can say if x is equal not strictly to null, then x is equal to zero. We can do it like this. Or we can use the ternary operator. x is something different according to a certain condition. For example, if x is null, then I will use zero. Otherwise, I will use x itself because it's a value that I care about. Or I can just turn it around. If x is not null, then I will give z a x or otherwise I will give a default value of zero. This is another way of writing this. Or with the nullish coalescing operator, I can say x is itself question mark, question mark, zero which means exactly the same as this ternary operator. So you have multiple choices, just use the one that you prefer. If you want to be more explicit, if you want to be more cryptic, if you want to be more bleeding edge, it's up to you. They are all equally valid. Usually I use this one, I, I, I must admit, because I'm not used to the knowledge coalescing operator and I, I, I'm, I'm a little afraid that if I start using it, my colleagues will not know it or will not understand it and will maybe confuse it for this other here and which has a slightly different meaning because it catches also the empty string and the zero. So I'm not really sure I want to use the knowledge coalescing operator anytime soon. I don't know. I'll see. <laughs> maybe on new projects I will do it.
Okay, so multiple ways to control the input and change it. And the cool thing is that when the input is passed as a parameter, you can do whatever you want to this parameter. You can convert it, you can provide a default value, but this parameter will, will not affect the outer variable, the outer scope uh, that passed this parameter. And finally, the important part of functions is returning a value. I always talked about returning a value without even, ever telling you what this is about. Well, returning a value is as important as passing parameters inside. In fact, let's see the difference between these two sums. We've got one function called sum, which is x, given x and y, and console logs uh, x plus y. And of course, we can use it the usual way. We can do sum of two and three. We can sum maybe three and five. We can sum five and seven. And we are starting to write the Fibonacci series here. Uh, well, we excluded one and one, but that's fine. Uh, but now we can also do another thing. We can create a function exactly the same as before, sum given x and y. But this time, instead of logging the value of x and y plus y, we can return it. If we return this value, this means that as soon as I invoke this function, maybe with 2 and 3, I will never, I won't see any output, but the sum is going to return a value that I can use to in any way I want. For example, I can store it in a variable, const result is equal to the result of summing two and three, and whatever is returned at the end of this function will be stored inside this variable. Or I can just console log immediately the sum of two and three if I want to. Or I can decide to do it later. I can console log whatever results came from the sum of two and three. So I can uh, use the return of this sum in any way I want. I can even alert if I prefer alerts. I can alert the sum of two and three. So as you can see, I'm uh, splitting the logic, the mathematical concept of summing two numbers together with the logic of presenting things to the user. And that is also why I cared so much about structuring your code into gather some input, perform some calculations, and then output to the user. You remember this? If we look at some previous, some previous, uh, not this one. <laughs> uh, if we look at some previous uh, examples, I always told you, first of all, we collect input from the user. Then we perform some calculations. And then finally, we output the result of these calculations to the user back again. If we start instead mixing those two together, it's more difficult because maybe uh, you are putting alerts in between and you want to change those alerts into console logs, you have to change those console log everywhere. And sometimes you don't even want to console log, maybe you want to uh, use document writes, you want to update some part of your application uh, graphically. So in that case, it's really, really dangerous to mix the real calculations and the graphical logic, the UI logic, such as printing values to the user or, or asking for, for, for values from the user um, together. So we want to separate these things and functions do exactly this. In a function, you can treat whatever piece of code you put inside of the function as a black box that takes some input as parameters and returns something. It usually returns only one thing. You cannot return multiple things. This is one limitation that every function has in almost every programming language. And we like this. We like the function to return only one thing. If you want to return multiple things, you still can, but in that case, you need some more complex data structure that we will see together, of course. But it's still one data structure that will be returned at once. So now that we know how to return, we can also see that this is something that we already used. We never declared functions like this, but we already invoked functions like this. 
For example, prompt, const answer is prompt, did you understand? With a default value of uh, no. As you can see, prompt is a function that takes two parameters and it returns something that will that can be stored inside of a variable. How do, I, how do you achieve something like this? Well, you just need a new keyword called return. At the end of, the, uh, of all the calculations, you can return this result. And I'm saying at the end because here I just got one line of code, but I can split it into multiple lines. For example, const result is equal to x plus y. And then finally, at the end, I'm going to return the result. So as you can see, I'm just putting the result at the end of the function as the final thing. I'm doing my calculations and finally I'm returning this result. So this makes functions pretty, uh, pretty generic. They become some sort of modular Lego bricks that you can use and reuse however you want. Here we use the function multiple times, but it's still going to always console log. In here, instead, we are using the function multiple times and every time we decide what to do with it. In the first uh, line of code, we decided to store the result in a variable and then console log it later. And here, we wanted to console log immediately. And in here, we want to alert the results of the sum. So we can decide what to do with the results of, uh, with the return of this function. Let's see if there's anything else that we can say. Yes, look at this code now. Function check age is having two return statements. Well, you cannot return two things. You cannot return two things. If you do it, uh, you will probably have a warning or an error of the fact that this code, this piece of code is unreachable because when you return something, you will quit from the function. The, the execution is over and it's not going to the, the, to the next line. Let's see what happens if I say return end. Okay, we return the results and then we return end. Let's see what happens. So this is a usual sum. I'm uh, calculating the results. I'm returning the results and then I'm also trying to return end. So if I'm trying to sum 2 and 3, and I want to console log this thing, it's just returning 5 with no end. This code is unreachable. Because as soon as you, as uh, JavaScript, the JavaScript interpreter, stumbles upon the first result, then there's nothing more to do. It will quit abruptly from the function and will not continue to the second return statement. But you can write multiple returns in the same function. For example, in, a, in, a, in an if-else cascade. For example, here in the function called check age, I'm checking if the age is greater than or equal 18, then I'm going to return true. Otherwise, I'm returning a confirm. Do you have permission from your parents? So these returns could be could could live in the same functions in the same function because they are not never uh, executed one after the other it's either this to be executed or this so you can have multiple returns in here but all, only one of them will be executed according to this condition um yep okay what else oh yes when oh, let's go back here what happens now when you invoke sum of 2 and 3? Well, in this case, as you can see, 5 is finally the return value. So now you finally understand what these arrows are. The right arrow is the prompt. It's the developer tools that are asking me for new inputs. And when I say 5, then this statement here is already a, job, a valid JavaScript statement and the statement is returning me the number 5. But there are other th statements that do not return anything. For example, console log is one of the statements that do not return anything. They print something, for example, hello. In fact, this is printed, but there's no error in here. 
This is just a side effect of console log. The side effect is that the function printed something, but console log doesn't return anything. It returns undefined. And how do you do that? Well, you know already, uh, if you want to create a function called print message, and here you got the message. Well, in the print message, you can, for example, console log the message. This is a pretty stupid function. Oops. And that's it. This print message will return nothing. It's exactly the same, the, the same thing as saying return undefined. In fact, when you don't return anything on a function, it's exactly the same as returning undefined. If I print the message now, uh, such as hello world, it's going to print hello world, but it's going to also return undefined. But print message can also be defined as a console log and return true. In this case, if I execute print message, it's going to console log the message, but also return true. And true in this case could maybe mean uh, the message was delivered successfully, which is not something that I recommend, but still, some people do it like this. They return a Boolean value that, that tells you if things went well or not. I'm not really a fan of this approach, but you will see it in someone else's code base probably. Or even in some frameworks. I think that Hibernate, uh, the Java framework for o o ORM, use the, uses this approach sometimes. Okay, so you can return things. You can also not return things. And you can also return nothing at all. If you use return this way, so without even saying return undefined, you say just return. This is exactly like saying return undefined, and it's a good way to force abruptly the stop of a function. So it's like the break of a loop. You return, which means that you're not going to continue with the rest of the function. You're just quitting the function altogether. This has exactly the same meaning as doing as returning undefined but in that case it can be used to stop immediately the execution of a function i'm not a fan of explicitly uh, abruptly interrupting the execution of a function but sometimes it's quite cool uh, i'm going to show you an, an example of this so Let's create a function called login. Login takes two parameters, which are username and password. And I'm stopping here because I want you to catch up with the code. I don't know if Angelo is, uh, is shouting at me right now. Oh, come on, I cannot follow you if you write so fast. And you would be completely right. Maybe you are not even chatting because you didn't even have the time to complain about my speed. So I'm going to slow down by myself. This is one of my limits. I go too fast because I want to prove a point. So I use the code to prove my point and I write the code as fast as I can to not stop in the middle of the sentence, to not say, uh, but just to 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 play along to just uh, uh, to say the sentence i'm so sorry but i didn't understand all at all what return does okay okay cool um i don't understand what return means nice okay so the concept of course derives from maths because in maths you can define functions and a function called sum in some mathematical notations is something like sum is a function that takes, uh, for example, two parameters, x and y, and will return something like x plus y. Functions in mathematics usually are a construct, a mathematical construct, that accepts an input and provides an output. And if you look around in the world, almost everything can be seen as a function, as a black box, in which you 
provide inputs and will give you an output. Uh, any machine, any piece of technology is something like this. The computer itself accepts multiple kinds of inputs. For example, it accepts the, well, the input from the camera, the keyboard, the mouse, the touchpad, the microphone. And then the computer is also able to provide some output. For example, something showing on the screen or the speakers uh, playing some sound or some light, some darkness or whatever. So a computer, I have no idea how is it done inside. I have a rough idea how a computer works, but I don't know this particular computer, what processor it has inside, what graphics, well, it's an Intel Core i7. I can see it on a label on top of my laptop, but I don't know, I don't remember what graphics card is inside of it. And I don't really care. I treat my computer as a black box. And I know that this computer accepts some inputs in some forms and will provide me some output in some form. If the computer is reliable, then if I give the same input, the computer will also provide me always the same output. For example, if I press A, it will show me A. And if I press again A, it will never show me S. It will always provide the A shown on the monitor. And everything can be considered a black box, even uh, human beings. I am a black box that accepts your uh, input, your feedback on the course, and will output with a better course. Or you can even see uh, engineers are black boxes. Let's see if I can find a meme about this. No, this is not a meme. This is just the definition of a black box. What is a black box? A black box is a box of which I cannot understand the content. I cannot see it. But the black box accepts some input and provides some output. Um, we usually say that, for example, mathematicians are strange devices that turn coffee into theorems. And at the same time, we can say this thing for developers, because developers are strange devices that turn coffee into solutions. And usually they also have a side effect, which is sarcasm. Let me see if I can find this meme for you. Um, coffee, developer, coffee, solution, and sarcasm. Yeah, we've got these, yeah, these kind of memes. Uh, you know what? I'm going to also put it in, in Discord. Feel free to provide any meme you want, as always. This Discord is yours. So please, please do whatever you want with it. So you see, the, pro the engineer is a strange black box, strange device that takes an input, a problem and some coffee and usually provides a solution with a side effect of sarcasm. And for, since so far we created functions like uh, print message, and this function maybe accepted some input, for example, the message that you see here, and usually provided a side effect. The side effect is something that happens, uh, but is not returned. It's not the final purpose of the function. So if I do a console log of the message, this is not a value that is returned from the function. It's a side effect. The, the primary reason of a function, uh, for, for existence of a function, is to return some value. And this function is not returning any value, it's not giving you any real output. It's just doing something on the side, which is printing a message, just like engineers use sarcasm. Well, as far as I know, some engineers have the sarcasm as the primary effect, and sometimes as a side effect, you provide a solution. But still, this, uh, th this argument is uh, still pretty valid. So the return statement is, well, the, the reason why a function exists in the first place. You want a function to accept some input as a black box, and then you want this function to provide some output. For example, return, uh, maybe the string you're in. And of course, I have to use double quotes because I'm using the single quote here. Okay, so this function accepts username and password and will return a result. The result is maybe the string you're in, or maybe it's the true Boolean value that says 
you are locked in or false means that you are not locked in. Let's do it with Boolean values. In the meantime, you could also have uh, some things happening. Ah. You could have things happening such as a uh, console log debug. <laughs> you can have even multiple console logs, but this is not what the function is supposed to do. These are things that um, are there along the way and are a side effect but the, the last thing that a function will do is returning true. So if you collapse this function and you read the signature of this function, if I just hover on the name of the function, I will see the signature of this function. It says function login. So it is a function, it's named login. It accepts two parameters, username and password. And as you can see with colon any, this is not real JavaScript. This is actually probably TypeScript getting in the way. But here TypeScript is suggesting that username and password are two parameters that can be of any type. You can pass a string, you can pass a number, you can pass a Boolean value, you can pass other functions even, uh, and we will see it. So you can do whatever you want with these parameters. There's no restriction. Because in JavaScript, there's no restriction. And then, as you can see, after the list of parameters, there's also another column and then Boolean, which says that this login is a black box that is taking two parameters in, as input and it's providing one output, which is a Boolean. It can be either true or false. I don't care about the console logs that are inside. I just know that if I ask the login function to do its work with some username and some password, login will return me true or false. And then I can do whatever I want with true or false. Maybe with true or false I can uh, alert something or I can call another function that says, okay, if the user is logged in, then show the items list. Or uh, I, I can do whatever I want. I can send an email to the administrator if the login was unsuccessful. I can do whatever. I I, I'm not restricted to the console log. I I get this output and then I do whatever I want with it. Bobby says, what if I am too lazy to write this whole function thing? Isn't there one big fat arrow that can substitute the eight letters? Yes, there is one big fat arrow and it's the third way we're going to write the uh, functions. So we, we are looking at function declarations right now. Then we will have a look at function expressions. And then finally, we will have a look at arrow functions. But these are three different ways to provide almost exactly the same thing. So first of all, I want functions to be completely clear in the first way. And once they are clear in the first way, you will see how easy it is to create the, the functions in the other two ways. Okay. Um, I don't know if this uh, input output was now clear to you, Angelo. If you still have doubts about it, uh, I can try to explain it a little better or I can provide some more examples. For example, we are going to do this login function, which will probably make things more clear. Or uh, another thing that I really want to do is to start refactoring our previous code so it uses functions. And in that case, you will see how powerful functions are. We are going to refactor one of the codes of the exercises that we've done on loops. And you will see how function is ju not just a fancy construct. It gives you a lot of advantages uh, rather than not using them. But um, in the meantime, since it's uh, 10.58 UTC, almost, uh, almost 12 o'clock my time, we're going to do our short coffee break two minutes in advance. So see you in five minutes, okay? Where's that? No, short pause. Okay, bye, see you later.
a few moments later. Here I am again, everything's fine. I had a very quick coffee and there's Angelo writing. When I type my code like function sum x, y returns x plus y, let x equal two, let y is equal to three, sum x, y, then the console just puts out five. So what is the return doing here? Maybe I'm a little stuck today. Help me step bro, lol. <laughs> I love this uh, reference. Okay, so let me just uh, sh get all your code. And your code looks like this. Uh, I'm going to add some uh, indentation that was probably removed when you copied the code into the uh, into the chat. And here we are. So this is a function which accepts two parameters, x and y. Everything good? Yeah, the mic is working. Okay. And uh, it returns the sum of x and y. Then you declare x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 3. And the sum, when you print it, will actually return 5. So if I do this, probably it won't work because I have other variables. So I'm refreshing. Okay. It's returning 5. So, so far, we used a console log. So far, we had to say function sum x and y and then here we do console log of x plus y and this seems to be working almost the same if i do sum of two and three it's still going to give me five but the output is slightly different if you think about it five is with a left arrow so five is returned from the function this other function here, when invoked, is printing 5 and then returning undefined. So this also means, for example, that if I want to get the sum and then reuse it for something else, in this case I cannot, because 5 is printed and then it gets lost forever. I'm going to show you one small example before going with login. Let's do another mathematical quest and the mathematical quest is to uh, calculate the hypotenuse of a right triangle let's see uh, so calc okay this is something that's not worth showing you right now so calcu oh, calculate the hypotenuse of a right triangle. What does the hypotenuse of a right triangle mean? Well, it means that if I have a right triangle such as this one here, which doesn't look uh, like a right triangle because uh, it's going to do everything in italic. So you know what? I'm going to write a string here. <clears throat> I'm going to create a template literal. <clears throat> this will make the right triangle be seen as a right triangle. Uh, let me, it's, it's pretty difficult to draw things here. Um, let's do with a plus and then dash 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 and then let's do a slash here slash there. Okay, does it look like a right triangle? Almost, yeah. A pretty stupid way to draw things with characters with ASCII encoding without without using a real uh, paint tool. So this is a right triangle because here we've got a right angle. We've got 90 degrees. And uh, probably you know Pythagoras theorem, which allows you to calculate the length of this, uh, of this edge here, which is called the hypotenuse. Uh, while well, these two sides, I don't know how they're called in English, probably just sides. We used to call them cateti in Italian, but uh, probably it's not your, your case. So uh, let's call them... No, before just mispronouncing them, I'm just going to have a look. Right triangle. How do you call these things? This is the hypotenuse, and the other two are legs, okay? They are not sides, they are legs leg one and leg two let's say or the shorter leg and the and the longer leg okay let's call them legs 
And as you can see, there's a formula for calculating the hypotenuse, which is take the first leg and square it, take the second leg and square it, sum the squares, and then do a square root of all the sum. So, we can say the hypotenuse is the square root, we can call it like this, SQRT, of leg 1 squared, which we know that we can call it like this, because there's this, uh, the uh, exponential operator, plus leg 2 squared. We don't care about the mathematical details, but this is something uh, that we can convert into real code. This is more a pseudocode. But it's something that we can do. Or if you don't want to say square root, we can find a way to mimic the, the behavior of a square root. Like it like this? Nice. Okay. <laughs> and usually we use the, uh, the, the, how's it called? I don't remember it already. You told me, Bobby, what this was. Uh, maybe the carrot? I don't know. But still, we can call it like this, okay? Uh, I'm trying to write in... Uh, pseudocode whatever this mathematical formula I find here. The hypotenuse is leg 1 squared plus leg 2 squared and all square root. And this will give me the length of the hypotenuse. So now the question is how do I write all of this? I can do it in multiple ways and uh, one way is to create just one piece of code. For example I can say const h is equal to, and then let's do all the calculations at the same time. For example, uh, to do the square root, I have to use math.sqrt, which we haven't seen yet, but you know that this math thing here has lots of things that we can use. Um, there's pi, or there are multiple functions like the imo or the floor, the round, etc, etc. And we also got the SQRT, which does the square root of a number that I give. So, for example, if I say square root of 9, it will give me 3. And what do I have to make the square root of? Well, all this stuff here. And all this stuff here is leg 1 squared. So, if I have a leg 1, I can say leg 1 uh, exponential 2 plus leg 2 exponential 2, okay? This is what we have. But, of course, uh, leg 1 and leg 2 must be provided somehow. So, how can I provide leg 1 and leg 2? Well, we can do two things. First of all, the usual way, we can ask the user to give us leg 1 and leg 2. So, we can do const leg 1 is equal to prompt the user for leg 1. Give me leg 1. The problem with this approach is that this approach will just work on the browser because prompt only works on the browser. I cannot do this on Node.js. So I need another way to get the input from the user on Node.js. And there's not um, a simple way to do that, but I can maybe abstract from the different environment in which I am executing this code by just using a function. Because if I use something like a function, for example, calculate hypotenuse, and this function takes two parameters as inputs, for example, leg one and leg two, which are the two parameters that I need in order to calculate the hypotenuse, well, in that case, this function works in every environment because there's no prompt, there's no console log. It's just going to take leg one, leg two from outside wherever they are uh, created. So, for example, in the browser, I can now do this. Leg, const leg one is equal to prompt the user. Const leg two is equal to prompt the user again. And then I can calculate the hypotenuse giving leg 1 and leg 2. This code only works on the browser because I used prompt. But this same function without the prompts can be used in Node.js. In fact, I'm going to open the ter oh, this coffee. I'm going to open the terminal, get into Node, pasting the function, 
And now this function can be used also when I don't have a browser available. In fact, I can say calculate hypotenuse given any two numbers that I can provide right here, for example, three and four, and I will come to the astounding number of nothing. Why nothing? It should give me five. Well, it's not. Uh, the cool thing here, the good news, is that it didn't break. Instead, if I used prompt, it would break because prompt is undefined on Node.js. But the bad news is that this calculate hypotenuse is not giving me anything at all. Because as you can see, inside of this, uh, uh, of this block of code, I'm doing my calculations and then I'm doing nothing with this variable. So in order to do something with this variable, I can, for example, alert h. I can alert the value of h. The problem with this approach, again, is that alert is only available on the browser. So if I take all of this code and I put it on the browser, for example, here, if I didn't put any errors, I, oh, okay, I have to also calculate the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. I hope it's, uh, it's called like this. So let me say three, let me say four, and then it alerts five. So this code, this code works perfectly on the browser. But if I now take all of this code and I put it on Node.js, you know what it's going to happen. It's going to break immediately because prompt and even alert is not defined. So I need a way to make my code at least the most important part of the code, work seamlessly regardless of the environment. This means that in this function, all the calculations must be performed without having any dependency from the environment in which I'm working on. So what I want to do is completely avoid using alerts. I can use console log because console log works in both environments, in Node.js but and also in the browser, but still, once I printed this console log, I cannot, uh, well, once I printed the hypotenuse, I cannot do anything else with it. I just printed it and uh, I lost uh, a reference to this variable. If instead I return h, this means that on the browser I can prompt the user for the input, I can calculate the hypotenuse and maybe also store it inside of a variable like this and then I can do whatever I want with it. For example, I can alert it. This thing here should work on the browser. Let me see. I'm giving three, giving four and giving five. This has exactly the same uh, value of, uh, this has the same outcome as what I've done so far. I'm just the only difference here is that the function knows nothing about the browser. It doesn't do any prompt. It doesn't do any alert. This function is so generic that I can completely reuse it even on Node.js. So here I'm going to paste this function on Node.js. And now I can ask to console log, or maybe, you know what, I'm going to do exactly the same as before. Const hypotenuse is equal to the results of calculating the hypotenuse, giving three and five, which, uh, three and four, which I'm providing just by typing them. And now that I have, uh, I've got the hypotenuse, I can do whatever I want with it. I cannot alert because I'm on Node.js, but I can console log it. Or I can even use it for some other calculations. And uh, it doesn't seem very clear right now, but let's try to refactor again this calculate hypotenuse. Let's say, for example, that we don't know how to, I don't know, how to sum things. So let's create a function called sum. Function sum of two numbers, number one and number two. This function, you already know how to write it, and it's a good practice to always type the same things over and over. This is just a return of num1 plus num2. 
now that we've got this function, we can make this calculation a little more clear by just splitting it into multiple steps. There's too much going on in here. So what do we have to, to do here? First of all, we calculate the squares of leg one and leg two. So we can say const leg one squared is equal to leg one squared. We do the same for leg two. If you want, you can copy paste. I'm writing everything from scratch, so I'm slower. Const leg two squared is equal to leg two squared. And then I have to sum these two guys. And I can do it by saying const sum is equal to leg one squared plus leg two squared. Because this expression, leg one squared plus leg, leg two squared, is a JavaScript expression that is not going to print anything. It's an expression that returns a value and the value is stored into sum. Well, the same goes with this function here, which is actually performing exactly the same operation. So I can replace this sum with uh, an invocation of my function. And this gives me exactly the same outcome. Uh, the problem is that I cannot call the variable sum, otherwise I have a clash between these names. So let's call it sum of squares. The sum of squares is the result of summing leg one squared and leg two squares. And finally, I can do the math SQRT of this sum of squares. So you see, I'm just splitting things. And this has, has exactly the same meaning as the thing that we had before. But as you can see, every time you do a JavaScript expression, this JavaScript expression returns something that you can then use and store it and you can print it and you can do whatever you want with it. Sometimes you can console log it or you can alert it, but that's not usually the, the, the thing that you want to do. You, you usually want to print the output at the end of any calculations. Any expression returns a value, even undefined. And this value can be used to be stored or it can be used to perform other operations like we are doing now. Uh, we can create other functions like, uh, I don't know, function square is a function that takes a number and squares it. So this function is going to return the number squared. And now I can use this function instead of this uh, strange double asterisk in order to, to, to create the leg one squared and leg two squares. So I can do square this leg one instead of uh, using the power operator and square leg two if I prefer. I'm just messing around with the code. I'm not saying that this is code that you have to write in production. I'm just playing with all this stuff. So as you can see, there's not a real difference between invoking an expression, executing a JavaScript expression, and executing, invoking a function that returns a value. Actually, the function behaves exactly the same as the expression. In fact, doing num asterisk asterisk two and uh, square leg one gives exactly the same results. The difference here is that whatever calculations we are performing right here can be hidden, encapsulated in this function. And I can perform multiple operations here and then only returning the final outcome. So the function allows me to write a complex calculation by just invoking one line of code. No condom, Chris! You should use a condom because it's safer. But do you have any tips for learning JavaScript for someone with a strong Python background? Um, well, probably the material that we are using right now is pretty good because it's, uh, it starts from scratch. So if you know how to declare a variable in Python, uh, you would feel at ease with declaring a variable in JavaScript. Since there are some differences between Python and JavaScript, I would definitely recommend you the material that we are using right now, which is this website called javascript.info. I think that this is a very, very well done tutorial for beginners, completely new buys of uh, programming in general, or for people that come from a different programming language. In fact, among my watchers and my students, there are some people that already know some programming language and they are learning the differences between their known programming language and JavaScript. 
So yeah, go for javascript.info. If you want more exercises, then go to freecodecamp, which is another free tutorial website. Pretty well done, but it follows a slightly different uh, path. Uh, so watch out because, for example, I wanted to see exercises on loops in freecodecamp, but all the exercises that I found here already give for granted that you know about arrays while in uh, this other tutorial, arrays are covered later, later on. So watch out for the order in which you, uh, you, you do this, um, these things. And then probably there's also some uh, JavaScript for Python developers, maybe. JavaScript for Python developers. There's always some... Yep, JavaScript for Py... Okay, this is maybe a paid academy. Is it not? I don't know. Or, uh, well, there are some books, there are probably some paid courses there, but I would probably go with uh, some basic JavaScript. There's also another online book that I never mentioned before. It's called Eloquent JavaScript, and it's another online book that you can find at this URL, eloquentjavascript.net, and uh, you can also buy the PDF version, I think, but it's an online book, just the JavaScript uh, info that we are doing right now. And um, I like better JavaScript info because this has a lot of words, <laughs> not much code, lots of words, and also no exercises at the end. So this is a very good book, but this is more for people that l prefer reading rather than doing. And I think that in JavaScript and in programming in general, you should be doing more than reading. Um, Angelo says, but couldn't you have done the whole hypotenuse thing with link deleted as well, or do you need return here? Um, I removed the possibility to add links, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, I will, s if you can share this link some, some, um, some way else, maybe on Discord. Angelo, you have access to Discord, so maybe you can... Oh, with console log, okay. Uh, yes, again, getting back to you. No condom, Chris says, I learned Python to get good and lead, at lead code, but I need to know JavaScript to do anything on the web. <laughs> and you're crying for that. Um, don't cry for that. It's, uh, JavaScript is awesome. And I recommend you to, to learn JavaScript because it's a very common uh, language nowadays. And I think it's a beautiful language. I also love Python. And they're not very different, of course, from the, from the basic syntax point of view. JavaScript can be a little more difficult if you are used to not using curly braces or semicolons. But um, yeah, Python is a very easy to grasp language. And uh, it's mainly used nowadays by data scientists, uh, people that do uh, machine learning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because they have more of a mathematical background rather than a programming background. But I think that if you know any programming language, such as Python, it would be pretty easy to catch up with JavaScript. So, Angela says, but couldn't you have done the whole hypotenuse thing with the console log as well? Or do you need to return here? Yes, I could do a console log here. In fact, if I calculate the hypotenuse, instead of returning h, I can console log h. The problem with this uh, is not really evident in this particular case, but it's pretty evident if you start, instead of uh, returning the square, if you console log it. What happens if you console log the square of a number? Yes, you can invoke this function to have the number squared and shown to you. So I can do something like function square num, and now I want to see what is the square of 9, and it will print 81 and return undefined. It will print 81, but now that 81 is printed on the console, I have, no, I have no way to reuse this number anywhere else. And now I concoctioned for you a case in which I want to reuse this number. I don't want just to print it. In fact, I don't even care to print this number. I care about having this number returned so I can store it in a variable and perform some other calculations with it. If I now copy all this code, so I copy the square function, I copy the sum function, and I copy the calculate hypotenuse function, and I try to use them 
here on Node.js. Everything seems to be working. Now I'm going to calculate the hypotenuse, giving three and four, and the result is completely wrong. It gives me three results, not even one. The first result being nine, the second result being 16, and the third result being none, not a number. Why? Well, because when I changed the square function from a return statement into a console log, the square now completely changed its behavior. It doesn't return the, the results of the calculation, it just prints it. In fact, 9 is the square of 3 and 16 is the square of 4. So it did its job, it did its calculation and it even gave me this partial result which I didn't even care about. And then, without returning anything at all, when I invoke square, square returns undefined. And when I return undefined, this means that invoking square on leg one will give me undefined. So leg one squared is a variable that stores the undefined value. And here I'm summing two undefineds. So I broke completely the code because instead of uh, having a, a function called square, which is a black box that takes an input and returns an output that I can reuse and combine in other functions, in other black boxes, I now just have a function that stupidly console logs this result and then this result is lost forever. I don't want this result to be lost forever. I want to return it. So I want to provide it as an output to the outer world because if I provide it as an output to the other world, I can do more, more things with it. For example, let's copy again. Now that this sum, this square is returning something, I can ask, hey, give me the square of nine, and it gives me 81. Now give me the square of uh, four, and it gives me 16. But now I can also calculate the hypotenuse of 3 and 4, which is internally using the square of leg 1 and leg 2, and it's going to do the calculation. So with one function, square, I can do multiple things, because with the result that I get, I can use it to print it, to alert it, I can use it to send an email to someone, or I can reuse the same result to be used in some other more complex calculations. Functions are the root of any modular programming because when you encapsulate uh, the, the, the code, the solution, inside of a function that accepts an input and provides an output, then these functions really work like small Lego bricks that you can then combine together and create something beautiful and very complex. And this is exactly what we are doing here. In calculate hypotenuse, I'm using the square function to have a partial result. I'm reusing the square function again on another parameter to have another partial result. I'm using the sum function to get another partial result. And then I'm using the square root, which I can become another function if I want to, to get another partial result, which is actually our last result. And now finally, I can return h and yes, I can console log h, but maybe I wanted to calculate the hypotenuse to do some other calculations. So it's better if I return this value so I can reuse it any way I want. I can alert it, I can console log it, or I can calculate anything else. For example, calculating the hypotenuse is used a lot in vector graphics, in games, because when you have two characters, maybe the player and the enemy in two separate places of your map, then if you want to check what is the distance between the player and the enemy, then you usually take the coordinates of the player, the coordinates x and y of the enemy, and you calculate this hypotenuse. So the function called calculate hypotenuse can be reused to maybe create another function that is calculate distance from enemy. Angelo says, oh, okay, now I understood it better. Thanks a lot. The example made it clear what you need return for. Awesome, great. Very glad to hear that because I ran out of examples, I must confess. <clears throat> okay, 
What else? What else? What else? Okay, there are some gotchas and I really recommend you to read carefully this chapter about functions because I'm really scared of not telling sorry, of not telling you all the got. Okay, I got it. <laughs> sorry guys. Uh, I'm scared of not telling you all the gotchas, all the possible gotchas. For example, the return is one of those strange keywords that are really really dangerous because if you return something and that something is on a new line since the, uh, let me show you here like this for example it looks good but it's not because as you know there is a statement which is return and then nothing else so watch out because if you put a new line here this thing will actually be evaluated as return and then calculate this expression. And this means that the square will just return undefined because this code is unreachable. Once you hit a return, there's nothing be ex being executed afterwards. So you don't want to, to add this extra new line here, otherwise it has a completely different meaning. If you want things to be on a new line for because of more clarity for example then you have to add a couple of parentheses just like this this works exactly the same you put everything in parentheses and inside of parentheses you can put as many new lines as you wish okay this is really important especially if and when we will talk about JavaScript frameworks such as React. Sometimes we incur into this problem because sometimes in React you have to return a very complex thing and you don't want to miss these parentheses, otherwise things will not work. So let's return things on, a, on the same line or let's return them on a new line but adding a couple of parentheses. The parentheses should be on the same line of the return. You see that here we got some parentheses, but they are on the same line of the expression. And this will still be evaluated as return and then perform this calculation. Instead, if you add the opening parentheses on the same line of the return, then you can do whatever new lines you wish without uh, incurring in that problem. Okay? Uh, there is a small section about how to name a function. And this is strictly related to the chapter about how to name variables. Naming things is one of the two hardest problems in programming. And you have to think a lot before naming a function just the way you want. There are some conventions there. And here you can see some conventions. For example, uh, well, there are some functions called show message, which probably is intended to show a message, print the message, or show the message graphically. Get usually is a function that returns something, or sometimes it calculates something before returning it, but usually no, it's just uh, some hidden variable that you want to make explicit. Uh, sometimes you have calc or calculate, and in fact, this is the term that I used here, calculate hypotenuse. Uh, or create, if your function is going to create something and then also return it usually. Or check is usually used for Boolean uh, functions. For example, check, uh, check login. Or maybe you can also use the is verb to say is user logged in yes or no so it usually returns a boolean value and when a function returns a boolean value we usually call it a predicate but you can just call it a boolean function hey no, no condom chris says what's the hardest if naming things is second hardest the first hardest thing is invalidating cache so two hard problems in pro in computer science are According to probably Martin Fowler or some other very important software engineer, there are, oh, Phil Carlton, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. Cache invalidation is in fact really, really complex and it happens when you are trying to store a result 
because you don't want to get it multiple times. But as soon as this value is changed, in that case, you have a local copy of the value that must be synced with the remote copy of that value. And it could be very difficult and tedious to do. In fact, luckily, we developers do not need to do cache invalidation because there are some technologies out there that uh, address this problem for us. But naming things is, a th is another thing that we have to care about. And uh, naming things is probably the hardest thing that we usually do. If you name things the wrong way, your variables and your functions do not convey the proper meaning and make your code very difficult to read. When you understand the problem at hand, it will be more likely that you will be able to name your variables and functions better. And in that case, it will be much easier for you to solve the problem. Because once you describe the problem in the proper way, with using the proper uh, terminology, the proper names, and you translate the problem into code, then you will see that automatically the solution becomes more clear, more, more, more easy, e easier to, to, to solve. So let's take uh, uh, a while to use the to, to, to find the proper names for every single function. Uh, here I didn't say calc square, but I could. I just wanted to say no, let's just square the number. Square is not the is, is not the shape. It's not the square. This is a verb in imperative form. Hey, computer, square this number. And this too. Hey, computer, sum these two numbers together. And this verb here too. Hey, computer, calculate the hypotenuse. Yes, I could have called it just hypotenuse. But it looks strange. Because hypotenuse is a thing. It's not an imperative verb. So I can square numbers. I can sum numbers. But I cannot hypotenuse numbers. In that case, I will say hey, calculate the hypotenuse or calculate the distance between these two numbers or something like that. So I'm using the imperative. Variables usually hold the name of something, of an object uh, in the real world of a, or a variable or number. But functions usually instead use the verb uh, in an imperative form because these are the orders that you are giving to the computer in a procedural language. Procedural language means a language that... Uh, is structured as procedure. We can also say an imperative language because this is a language where you d you demand, you ask the user, gently, the computer gently or not gently to do something for you. There's no use in say calculate hypotenuse please. So you will be a little more imperative and less less kind. You will say hey calculate hypotenuse. The computer will probably not be mad at you if you don't ask politely. No Condom Chris says, just checked out your YouTube channel. Awesome content. You're a real chad for doing this. Thanks a lot, No Condom Chris. I hope you will enjoy my past lessons. This is a lesson number 15, and we started counting from zero, so it's the 16th lesson. Every lesson is four hours long, so you, there's a lot of content to catch up. I encourage you, if you're brave enough, to look at the content, uh, the this uh, material by yourself. But, of course, if... Uh, if you need some more guidance and if you need some more motivation, I'm here for you um, because I, I like to do these things for you guys. Angelo says, is it correct to say that in line 180 of your code, 180 of your code, uh, the return H is obsolete because we will only need it if we were using it in another function or declaration? Okay, that's a nice question. So, first of all, obsolete, I think it's an improper name because obsolete means it's old and we don't want to use it anymore. Uh, we, you can say that it's useless because you are not planning to use calculate hypotenuse anywhere else other than just alerting or prompting. And in that case, you would be right. You can say just alert h in here, or you can console log h in here. But the question that I'm asking you right now is, is it really worth it? Is it worth to tie calculate hypotenuse to the availability of the alert function? Or is it better to make this calculate hypotenuse so generic that one day can be reused somewhere else 
Maybe not now, maybe I'm not planning to use calculate hypotenuse other than just printing the value. But maybe one day I or someone else will want to use this function to combine it into something else. In that case, I would rather prefer to use return h instead of just console log. And the same goes with, uh, with the parameters. I, if I know that leg 1 and leg 2 right now are the numbers 3 and 4, why should I bother having parameters? I can use 3 and 4, and that works exactly the same. But now the function is tied to these inputs, and I cannot change them. So, in order to make this function more reusable, I want these two numbers, 3 and 4, to be provided from outside. This way I can use this function, calculate hypotenuse, right now with the numbers 3 and 4, and maybe some other day with other numbers. So it's all about code reusability. Reusability. We are starting to use a lot of uh, engineering concepts. Modularity, reusability. We are, well, we can also think about readability of our code, because when I take this bit of code and I give it a name, calculate hypotenuse, I don't even need to care what this code does. I can just trust the, the code and say, hey, this is a function that calculates the hypotenuse and I don't care about how it does it. I just know that if someone created this function correctly, it will just calculate the hypotenuse. It will just, uh, you know, um, how do you say that? Uh, it will, oh, come on. Uh, it, it, it will maintain the promise, let's say, okay? I see, it's more practical. Was just wondering because H in this example is already used for the declaration of const, but you are obviously right, it's better to return it. Um, yes, actually, here I declared const and then I'm returning, but I can also return the result of math squared directly without, without even bothering creating this variable. Uh, I'm going to still return a value and then this value can be used elsewhere. This function is so generic that it can be used with any two inputs and can return this output to be used anywhere. This makes the function really, really reusable. And you can see the reusability of the function as soon as you start refactoring the code that we have created so far that doesn't use functions. For example, let's go to, I don't know, Shapes Reborn is already too, too, too big. Let's go to the, one of the first shapes, the rectangle. Rectangle builds an ASCII rectangle given the number of rows and columns. And you know what? I would like to see your solution, Angelo, because your solution was really, really good. And I want to use, was it here? No, this is an isosceles triangle, so I probably lost. But I probably have it still on my desktop. Yeah, I do. Okay, I should put this on my portfolio, actually. So, your first exercise here was very clever because you used uh, the concept of a row template. So, you created a template and then you reused this template multiple times. And... Let's try to reuse all of your code and turn it into something that uses functions. So this is your code. Let's num row blah blah. So this is the prompt and this is the user input. So we cannot do more. Um, we cannot do much about this. This is the user input and the input is, is collected with prompts. But then, starting from here, we've got the real calculations. And then, just like I told you, at the end of the calculations, you are printing the output to the user. Which was a very clever way to structure your code, because this way you are first collecting user input, then you're performing the calculations, then you're printing the output, which is exactly the same thing that usually a function does. It collects input as parameters, it performs calculations, and then finally returns something that can be, for example, printed to the user. So all of these calculations can be wrapped inside of a function that I will call uh, build rectangle or something like that. 
in imperative form. You see, I'm wrapping everything inside of this pair of uh, curly braces. And then I can also indent everything so it looks more clear that everything is inside of this build rectangle. And the rectangle is a function that can take the number of rows and the number of columns. So we can use it like this, num rows or num row or a num call. So now we've got a function that doesn't require to prompt. I can already start using this function here and I can use it on Node.js, for example. So if I go to the terminal now, ah, oh, come on. Okay, if I go here, I can paste, and now I can, uh, was it calculate? No, it was build. Now I can invoke build rectangle by specifying the number of rows, which will be five, and the number of columns, which will be seven, and it will return nothing, because I forgot to do it. This thing here, this function, is performing a lot of calculations, but at the end of it, it's not console logging, because console log was purposely left out of the function. What I want to do at the end of the function, instead of doing a console log, I want to return this final result. And the final result, you called it final string. Final string. So let's do this again, I'm sorry. Uh, let's have this function. As you can see, I wrap the code inside of a function that has a name, the input parameters, and if I don't put these input parameters, probably the code will break, and a return statement, because at the end of the function, I always want to return some value. So I'm going to copy again this function and put it in Node.js. Ah, not clar. Now that I have this function defined, I can build a rectangle and with no parameters, it's already starting to suggest that it's going to return an empty string. But I want to have uh, three rows, which is giving me three backslash ends, three new lines, completely empty, and five columns. And this is what I have. Not really good. It's one whole string, which has asterisks and new lines. Now, what I can do with this thing is I can now I can uh, store the results on uh, on a variable maybe and use the usual console log to print the results. And now it looks a little better. So the code is working exactly the same as before. I didn't even touch the the calculations inside of it but now i made this function a little more generic a little more reuse reusable because it accepts any number of rows or columns and it will provide an output that i can use however i want for example let's say i want to create a function uh, i'm going to create it here because i think it will be pretty difficult i'm going to create a function that is going to be called build double rectangle. Build double rectangle, given the number of rows, let's say rows and columns, will, you know what, will build the rectangle, given the number of rows and the number of columns. And as you can see, I'm using a different variable name but this is not a problem. The parameters are mapped one by one positionally. So the first parameter, which here is called rows, is the first parameter that you see here, which in this case is called num row. And the same goes with the second parameter. So you have to take to be aware and take care of the position of the order in which you specify the parameters. This is actually going to invert the rows and the columns, which is not something that you want. You want to have the rows listed before the columns because this function build rectangle is expecting the number of rows to be listed before the number of columns and in build double rectangle i can call build rectangle twice but the first rectangle is the first one and i can store the results on the first on the on this variable and then I can do the second rectangle. I can perform the calculation. I can store it in the second one. And then I can return 
the sum of both. So as you can see, I'm combining, I'm reusing build rectangle twice, and I'm then concatenating whatever is the result of this rectangle in order to have something new, something called a double rectangle. If I now build a double rectangle, I can use three rows and five columns, and it's not going to work because I, I'm used to have different naming conventions. Let's do columns, columns. Let's try again. But in this case, I have to copy everything. So, oh, too much. Ah, okay, I'm gonna go with the arrow keys. So I'm going to copy build rectangle and also the function that it's using it, which is build double rectangle. Paste. And now if I try to build double rectangle, I can give a three and five. And if I want to, I can start console logging it right away. I don't need to store everything in a variable always. If I just want to console log the value, I just wrap it inside of a console log. And this is what I have. This is a double rectangle because it has a rectangle and then another one. So I combined this function in order to have something bigger. Uh, I could do a console log in here instead of returning, but this way I can reuse whatever is the result of build rectangle to do whatever I want. And the same goes when going inside of your function. Your function has a lot of complex calculations. Can we instead separate this function into smaller problems with all the small solutions and then use these solutions inside of this code? For example, I know for sure that a fact, uh, for a fact that your code is creating a template for a row, for a single row. And this is cool. We can create a function and called build row template, for example. And build row template will just hold the code that is, is going to create the row template. So it's going to start with an empty row template. And then this is the code that creates the row templates. But it requires an I, which was initialized here. So I also need to add an I here. And that's it. The row template can now be used. So the only thing that's left to do is to return the row template so it can be reused somewhere else. Uh, if this is more clear for you guys, I can turn this into a for loop because it gives less noise. So I can say for and I put the begin statement here. Then this is the continuation statement and this is the step statement. So I can remove the step from here. I can s remove the initialization here. And there's another thing that's missing here. This function, as I see, depends on this variable here called numcall. So I have to pass it as a parameter, numcall. So this is a function that given num the number of columns will build a row template. And this row template can be reused multiple times uh, in many different occasions, known occasions or even unknown occasions, because once the building block is well created, I can uh, use it for uh, other things that I intend to use now, or maybe it can be used for other things that I intend to use later on. I can even come up with new ways to use this building block. And it's the principle uh, at the root of Lego bricks, because Lego bricks allows you to, yeah, to create the, the thing that you have in the box, but also come up with new things that were never planned in, in the first place. And the same goes with uh, a lot of technologies that we have nowadays. Even in programming, we've got libraries, we've got frameworks. All, all these libraries and frameworks give you some ready-made code, which is so generic that can be used and reused in different ways. You can have a charting library, which I can use for uh, creating the dashboard of my uh, of my business application, business management application, or I can use the charting library to show the statistics of my gameplay or whatever. The charting library is generic enough 
to be used in multiple different contexts, in multiple different ways. And this is, we are going to do the same in small with functions. This function, build row template, if it's well written, will allow me to make this problem slightly simpler because we don't care about creating the row template here. This problem was already solved somewhere else. In fact, I can say let row template is build row template given the number of columns. And that's it. I give for granted that I know how to build a row template. And so this way, I don't need to do this because it was already encapsulated in this function. And I don't even need this variable here because it was already used somewhere else. So now if I reorder things, uh, let, let's change this while into a for loop too. For uh, let j is equal to zero, so I don't need this. J is less than number of rows. And then here I can say J plus plus without having the increment here. So this code is really, really similar to this other code here. It has an initialization, which is exactly the same as this one. It has a for loop in which I'm incrementing the string. And then at the end, I'm just returning the file string. So as you can see, the problem maybe looked slightly complex, but now it's just one problem that is solved with, uh, with a smaller problem. And we can even put this piece of code in its own function if we want to. We can do something like function. Um, this is, well, build the final string starting from the row template. So we can say, uh, I don't know, um, concatenate rows given the number of rows and using the row template that, that must be created beforehand. If I want to concatenate the rows, this will give me the final string. It will be pretty much exactly the same thing that we have here. We'll have the final string, which is the result of, con of a concatenation. And uh, for j, the start from zero and uh, stops at number of rows, it will just concatenate all the templates that we created before and then will return the final string. So the build rectangle problem now becomes two steps. It becomes creating the row template and then creating the final string, which is the result of concatenating the rows, given number row and the row template that we created before. Which as you can see, is not only the exact same thing that was the requirements. If we look at the requirements, how I wrote these requirements, it was something like the problem can be split into multiple sub-problems. First of all, how to build one row. And we solve this problem in its own function. It's called build row template. So now the function, if, it, if we know it works, we can just collapse it and give for granted that this problem is solved. I don't need to have any more this problem in my mind. I can free my mind because this problem is already there solved. And then what's the other problem? How to repeat the process? And well, to repeat the process, I have to concatenate the rows. And this is another problem that I have solved. So finally, building a rectangle is just a combination of these two solutions together. I first start creating the row template, then I concatenate the rows together, and then I have the solution to my problem. As you can see, functions are a way to encapsulate our logic and to free our mind of the internal details of some logic. As soon as we know that this thing works, because we tested it, we, we debugged it, we know that it works, we can just close the function and forget about how it was implemented. Now we can use this function as a building block that we can reuse for, to solve some other more complex problems. And if you remember my first lesson probably, or first, first or second lesson, I told you that all of engineering in general is a matter of solving small, low-level problems and combine those small, low-level solutions into higher-level and more complex problems. If you do this, then you will have 
a huge power in your hands. If you try to solve instead uh, the, the, the problems as we always did, this is really, really complex as a solution. And one day I will get back to the solution and I, couldn't, I will not be able to wrap my head, my head around this problem. If I look at the number of lines about this problem, I see that the lines are... What? No, these are the number of characters. Can I see how many... Can I see how many lines we have, or do I have the, to make the subtraction? This is line 117, and I was starting in line 82. And since I'm not a good mathematician, I will ask politely JavaScript, hey, what's 117 minus 82? So these are 35 lines of code that if I look at them right now, I will say, oh my God, what is this? I don't remember. I have no idea what this is. But if instead I try to refactor this code into small reusable functions that can also be collapsed, then this problem will show just like this one. It will show as a series, a sequence of steps, small steps that I have to, uh, to, 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 to make in order to solve the overall problem. So we had to pay a lot of effort into um, translating this series of hints into this whole huge code base. The hints were, we have to know how to build a full row. We have to know how to build an empty row. Then we have to know how to build the whole rectangle, knowing that the first and the last rows are always full and all the other rows in between are always empty. How do we approach this? We either approach it as a whole problem, which was really, really difficult to write, and now it's pretty difficult to read, or we can approach this problem as many small sub-problems that we can solve independently, one in its own function. So, I don't know if you want to refactor your, this code by yourselves or you want me to do this. Uh, I will probably do this together with you guys, and then you can try and, con and redo it again as an exercise or continue doing the same thing for the other shapes. This is mostly the exercise that I'm going to give you for the rest of the week, refactoring all of your code into functions and try to appreciate the thing. So I can copy all this code here up to line 117 and I'm going to redo exactly the same exercise here but refactoring into functions. Are you ready? So one thing that really helped me here is to create all these comments that are somehow markers of when a piece of a problem was solved. All these markers, I put them on purpose because they are easily translated into functions. Instead of creating a comment which says, here in this block of code, I will create the top row. Instead of doing this, I can just write a function. Function build top row. I wrap all this code inside of uh, a function. I make sure that I have all the necessary uh, input in order to solve this task and I see that I don't have enough input because top row is created here, J is created here, but columns is not present, is, was not declared inside of this function, so it must be passed from outside. Okay, so I'm building the top row given the number of columns and this should probably already work. And if I name it like this, I can completely remove this comment because it's stupid. Of course, I'm beginning to build the top row and here the problem ended. So I'm removing completely these comments here and instead I can invoke this function build top row in order to build the top row. So I don't have the top row here, but I can I can just say let top row is equal to result of building the top row given the columns. And now I have the top row. This code will probably work exactly the same as before. Um, 
when I do all these exercises, I really encourage you to actually test what you're doing. So now I'm moving things around and give for granted that they work. But in uh, the real scenario, even I, not only, not only new buys, you should always move, a, move one thing, change a variable, and then test that the output is working accordingly. So I'm going to maybe do something like this. Um, I'm going to create another script here. Nanoscript.js and I'm going to remove whatever was inside of the script because I don't care anymore. And I'm going to paste all this code. And finally, I'm going to console log the empty rectangle because I want to check if the empty rectangle works. So this is all the code that I had so far. And now I can node the script so it will give me, ooh, not working properly. Why is it not working properly? Because I'm still uh, forgetting to return. Remember that every function should have some input and especially it should return some output. So I have to return the top row from the build top row function. This way I can use the outcome of build top row inside of another function. So in this case, I'm going to just make it here, uh, return the top row, just another space. And now the rectangle works exactly the same as before. So I should have done it in, uh, in multiple instances. I should have showed you how this works um, without touching anything, but then I already touched something. Build top row is a function that is already uh, working the proper way. I had to take the block of code and wrap it inside of a function, reason about the name that I want to give to this function, and probably this name is not even correct. And then I have to reason about what are the, um, the needed inputs for this function, and then I had to reason about what is the final thing that I want to return from this function. Why am I saying that this function is not, has not the prob probably the right name? Well, I don't expect you to remember it, but this is the code that builds the top row. And if I look at how to build the bottom row, I will see that the code is almost exactly the same. Well, probably it's exactly the same. The only thing that maybe changes is that there's no final backslash n here. Oh no, there's, there is one, yeah. This code is exactly the same as the top row. And it shouldn't uh, surprise you because the top row and the bottom row are exactly the same. So instead of uh, copying the same code for the bottom and the top row, we can make things more generic. Build top row could be called build full row because both top row and the bottom row are still full rows. They are rows made with all asterisks. And I can make this more generic this way. So top row, I will call it full row here because I think it's a better name. And build full row can be used for two things. It's so generic that it can be used for the top row and also for the bottom row. How do I do this? Well, if I go here below, I can say that top row is the result of building a full row. And then I can create a bottom row, which is the result of building exactly the same full row. Or as a um, bottom row. Or as Angelo would do, I would probably create a template. So I can say let full row template is equal to the result of building a full row. And then the top row will be exactly the full row template and the bottom row, which will use exactly the same variable because it's exactly the same, the, the, the same shape. So we don't even need to do this copy pasting of uh, code because functions allow you to reuse pieces of code. They are so generic that if you pass the proper parameters, you can reuse the same block of code different times and in, also in multiple ways. In this case, we are just using uh, the same functions 
the same function with the same parameter. So, but if you look at the other shapes, you will see that you will be able to create functions that behave differently according to different parameters, uh, to different inputs. So, build full row is now a function that allows you to reuse code, make it more generic. So, as I was saying, I don't even remember where. I have to check again. As I was saying here, functions allow you to have more modularity, improve readability of the code, because you don't need any more markers, any more comments. The, the function name itself tells you what the function does. And if you name the function correctly, in a very explicit way, you don't even need to add explanatory comments, because the function name says it all. And as always, as I already said, functions allow for reusability because you can reuse the same function multiple times. And as you can see, reusability also means that you can reduce code duplication. You can, re you can reduce copy and paste. Before we had the bottom row and the top row to be a copy paste of two different things that were exactly the same. But now with functions, we can encapsulate that logic inside of one function, and then we can reuse this function multiple times. There's also another advantage, uh, which, is, which is a small advantage here, but you know that sometimes we need to use different variable names because otherwise these variable names will clash. And uh, Angelo's code was very, I think it was this one, no, no, it was the, it was the warm-ups. So in here, Angelo uh, was trying to run the same piece of code in the same file, but since he had to create multiple variables, uh, multiple in indices, multiple iterators, uh, at first he used i, then he had to use g, then he had to use h, then he had to use j, etc., k. We've got so many sn, gn, we've got so many different variables because of course in this code, if you try to execute this code and you redeclare the same variable over and over again, the code will give you an error. And the error is just because you wanted to declare the same, a variable with the same name. Well, as you know, functions allow you to better encapsulate these variables. So this means that, for example, let's see, let's see this one. Uh, here I've got a function called build row template and it uses an iterator called i. Here we are using another fun we are we have another function called concatenate rows in the same file which is using another index called j. But now we can use the same variable. For two reasons actually. The first reason is that the variable is declaring a for loop, so the scope is already local to the for loop. But even if we declare this variable in here, this variable will never clash with this other variable here because they are encapsulated in their own functions. And you can redeclare how many functions you want, uh, how many variables you want in the functions, and they can have also the same name, the names will not clash. So that's another nice advantage that we have with functions. You don't need to care too much about the names of variables and how they clash between different blocks of code because you can just reuse them uh, inside of the same function. So as you can see, we are able to create a function called build full row and now you understand that we can do exactly the same with build empty row. So as you can see in the full loop, we are creating an empty row, but this empty row can be created as its own problem solved by its own function. So I can create another function here called build empty row. And I don't care what this row will be used for. I just put in, I put myself in the shoes of the person that has to only solve that specific piece of the problem. And once that specific piece of the problem was solved, 
I can just forget how I solved it. I can just use the problem as a solution to solve other more complex problems. So build empty row will probably have all this code here. Copy, paste. And here I can see that empty row starts with an empty string. I start with a J that is one and J is less than columns minus one and columns must be probably given as an input here because otherwise I don't have it. Empty rows will be increased and then empty row becomes this thing here. And then I have to remember to return the empty row so it can be used from outside the function. I think that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm using a J here and I'm using a J here too. And there's no name clash because they belong to, well, different for loops, but also because they belong to different functions. So there's no clash in here. And now that I know how to build an empty row, I can use it here instead of doing all this. I can say let empty row is equal to the result of calling build empty row, which I don't find given the number of columns. There's probably some... Is there any... Oh, build empty row, build empty row. Okay. So now I know how to build an empty row. And this code should work exactly the same as before. Hopes, hopefully. Um, how do I do this? Uh, let's just node here. Did I do a console log at the end? Uh, no. So let's do a console log also. Console log of uh, empty rectangle. Okay, so I want to copy all this code. Let rows and columns, I think it's better to place it in here at a certain point. Um, wait a second, no, 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 no. Stupid thing. Sorry. Uh, I'm not going to do this right now. I'm going to do this later. Uh, so I'm going to copy all this. And then I'm going to clear and uh, execute node. And then I'm going to paste. And now the rectangle is exactly as before. So we're just refactoring our code. Refactoring is a really important part of software development. And it's so overlooked that so many people out there, so many developers, especially experienced ones, I don't want to say even experience one, especially them. They are not used to refactoring. They write the first thing that comes to their mind and then they say, I don't have time to refactor. I have so many new requests going that I don't have time to refactor. But refactoring is really, really important because it changes your code in a way that doesn't affect at all the behavior of the code. But you will see that refactoring and refactoring, we, we make our code more Let's go back to the, that part here. Uh, we make our code more modular, more readable, more reusable, and we also reduce code duplication. So these are all, we can say, non-functional requirements because they are called non-functional requirements because, well, of course, the uh, empty rectangle problem is a problem that is solved as soon as I'm able to draw an empty rectangle. But... The non-functional requirements is that, well, the rectangle should not also show, but it should also be a good piece of code that I can read and I can change and I can evolve. And uh, it's so modular that it uses some uh, functions that I can maybe even reuse. For example, this build row template looks a lot like this other thing here, build full row. So there's no need to use to create two different functions. I could use the same function to solve both problems, the, uh, the full rectangle and the empty rectangle. So this function is so powerful that it can be reused to solve two different problems, not only two different parts of the same problem, the top row and the bottom row, but it can also be used to solve the previous problem, which is build the full rectangle. So now that we know how to build a full row and now that we know how to build the empty row, we know how to build the empty row here and we can even very easily use Angelo's uh, solution about creating a template, as always. Uh, every empty row will be exactly like this. So we can do something like 
moving this outside, this is an empty row template if we want to. And now in this for loop, we are just concatenating multiple empty row templates over and over again. And as you can see, this is really, really similar as code to the other one that we had so far here. We are concatenating all the rows, a certain amount of rows with some template. So we can even get rid of this function or reuse this function, concatenate rows, because it does exactly the same thing. Well, not, all, not, not exactly because we have a different, um, different, a different beginning and a different, uh, and a different end. But still, if we want to make things more dynamic and more generic, yes, we can reuse the same function. So right now, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to say function build, let's say middle rows, because these are the rows in between the top row and the bottom row. So a function like this will have all this code here. And let's see what do we have in this code. So build middle rows. It's going to create a row template. It's going to create an empty rows array. Then it's starting to iterate from i to the number of rows, which is probably a parameter that I have to give. And I also have to give the parameter columns because it's, it must be passed from outside. I don't have it here in this function. And then it's going to create the empty rows by concatenating all the empty rows template. And finally, I can return the empty rows. And that's it. So I know how to build a full row. I know how to build an empty row. Now, if my code is correct, I also know how to build my middle rows. I don't care how, do I, how I do it, so I close it. I don't really care. The only thing that I care about is now that I can completely remove everything from here and say that empty rows is just the result of build the middle rows, whatever they are, given the number of rows and the number of columns, because this is what this function expects. So now empty rows is this, and I think that we have everything in place. So now if I look at only this part of the code, I can see that in order to create the empty rectangle, I need to create my empty rows, create a full row template that will be used as the top row and the bottom row, and then the empty rectangle will just be a concatenation of the top row, the empty rows, and the bottom row. If I want to make it even smaller, I can call this just a full row, for example. I don't even care to say that it's a full row template. I'm just going to call this full row two times. First a full row, then another full row as the bottom one. I don't even need to use these two variables if I really don't care to. Uh, if they explain it better, then yes. But otherwise, it's fine like this. I'm going to create my empty rows, I'm going to create my full row, and then, well, these can be called middle rows, so it's more coherent to what you see here in the name of the function. And this will be my empty rectangle. All this block of code can be encapsulated in its own function. Build empty rectangle. I place everything inside of this and I just need to care about what is the, 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 the important input and what is the return that I expect. So here the input is, <clears throat> this is created here, but it needs columns. This is created here, but it needs rows and columns. This is created here, and it just requires everything that is that was created inside of this function. So I see that the only thing that I need is rows and columns. And at the end, I'm just going to return the empty rectangle. So I can just return that variable or just return everything. The full row, the middle rows, and the full row. And then I can forget about it. I, I just collapse it, and now... I can move these rows and columns here. And the only thing that I need to console log is build empty rectangle given the number of rows and the number of columns. I know that I went very fast, but in this case it was on purpose because I would like you guys to try to do this by yourselves at home. Uh, I just want to prove a point right now and show you the different way that we could solve this problem by just 
adding functions to our code base. Shapes, Re uh, empty rectangle, where's that? Empty rectangle is a problem in which we have to know how to build a full row and this problem can be solved independently because we can create a function, build a full row and once we know that this function works, we can just collapse it and forget it. Problem solved. I don't need to care how to build a full row anymore. Then, how to build an empty row? Let's create a function that knows how to build an empty row and then let's forget about it. Then, how to build a whole rectangle knowing that the first and last rows are always full and all the other rows in between are always empty. So, we created another middle problem which is how to build the middle rows which is iterating over building the empty row and then once this problem is solved building the empty rectangle is just a sandwich between creating the full row creating the middle rows and then having the series of full row middle rows and then full row now we've got a function that given any number of rows or columns will build the empty rectangle let's try it out Uh, clear, node, paste, and this is my rectangle. But now I can console log whatever other build empty rectangle I want. For example, I can say 5 and 7, and this is still working. And now my build empty rectangle function is a black box that I don't know how it is shaped inside. I don't even need to know. And it's really, really e easy to invoke this function. Instead of invoking the whole code, I can just invoke one line of code to have my new rectangle. I can do it with another, maybe an even number of things. No, even numbers are very dangerous in this case. Let's do 3, 9. And this is a very narrow rectangle etc etc so as you can see functions are really really helpful look at this i even well, i was able to be i was even able to collapse all my functions in the editor so it was even easier to copy and paste all of this code to make it work on my node.js environment so very nice and then if i want this to be to be working on the browser i can say that rose is a prompt columns is a prompt and instead of console logging I can alert and this works exactly the same or I can use this empty rectangle to create something else or I can create the build full row function to create something else for example let's solve the full rectangle now again function build full rectangle given the number of rows and the number of columns. What is a full rectangle? It's a rectangle made with just full rows. So in here, I just need to iterate an i that starts from zero and ends when I reach the number of rows. And for every i, I can just create and concatenate all the full rows. So let full rectangle is equal to an empty string. We start with an empty string as always. And at the end, we want to return the full rectangle, whatever it is. In the middle, we do the calculation. What is the calculation? Oh my God, I, do I need to remember how to build a full row? No, because I have this function here, here, build full row given the columns. So I can just say, hey, full rectangle, accumulate yourself with, uh, with the results of build full full row given the number of columns. I don't even remember how this build full row was implemented, but I don't care. I know that it's able to build a full row. Actually, I need to remember if, it's, if it has the backslash n, and it has. So that's it. Now I solve the build full rectangle problem. How much time did I take? Well, not, not that much, but of course, because I was pretty fast in typing, but also because now the problem of building a full rectangle is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code instead of all the code that we had before. So I can do this, build full rectangle, console log, build full rectangle, oop, given three and five, and this is my full rectangle. 
You see how code reuse is achieved through the use of functions. So functions are really, really easy as a syntax. You just need to add this keyword function, then the name of a function, and you have to choose it properly, uh, as properly as you can, because if these functions were called x, y, and z, it would be really, really difficult to understand what they do. You have to inspect inside of the code uh, of the of the uh, of the function body in order to understand what this function does. But if you name those functions correctly, then you don't need to to explain anything. If you need some more explanation, you can still create a comment. And when you do the comment with the double asterisks at first, it's also going to create this stuff here. This is uh, some documentation stuff that we don't really care, but it's a way to tell, for example, columns should be a number. And if you say this, when you hover on the, uh, on the, the name of the function, you will see that the signature changed a little bit because the signature says that this is a function, it's called build full row, and the columns, the parameter columns that it expects, should be a number. So this documentation here, which is auto-generated as soon as you do slash asterisk asterisk and then go to a new line, uh, you see it's, it also t it's also told you a hint. This is a JS doc comment. So this is a comment that is, is, um, is a special comment that allows you to create documentation for your code. So if you hover on it, you see columns is any. But if you specify here that the columns should be actually a number, then in this case, it will tell you that columns should be a number if you hover on it. But this is just a suggestion for the developer. It doesn't do anything at all. Comments are completely ignored by the JavaScript interpreter. And this is only useful for you if you want. Uh, and you can write something like build, a row full of asterisks. This is a comment that explains that a full row is a function that builds a row full of asterisks. Uh, maybe you can say also, maybe you can say build a row made of uh, columns asterisks. So the number of asterisks that you want to, to, to add, why not? I will go a little further on this, but I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that you are quite puzzled by now because I wrote a lot of code and it will become more and more like this because now that we have such powerful tools, our code will stop being just three lines of code. It will start being a lot of lines of code and we have to um, we have to find a way to organize your R code and not lose ourselves in this whole uh, file, big file full of functions and variables. And I will show you how to do this. So are, are you still there? Everything's fine? It's a lot. In fact, this is the only thing that we are covering today. But I think that in one week, we will be able to understand and maybe practice on this quite a lot. As always, I'm going to do a practice session next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Um, 8 p.m. UTC, which is 9 p.m. my time. Okay, so we've got a message from Angelo, but uh, he sent the message on Slack. Oh, it was a lulz. When Anthony rewrote the function shape task in two minutes and your eyes could barely follow. I'm sorry, Angelo, you're right. Uh, I was really, really fast on this and uh, I'll try to be slower now. I love this meme. Thanks a lot. Okay. Who said that the row should be made of asterisks? What if I went to create a rectangle that accepts any kind of character. I want uh, a rectangle made, I don't know, of question marks. I want a rectangle made of uh, hash symbols. How can I do this? Well, the asterisk here is hard-coded, as we say. So if you close this function, 
you have no way to control the fact that you are going to display an asterisk or, or an asterisk or anything else. And so one thing that we could do is to give this character, this cell, if we want to call it like this, as a parameter. We can say that we accept a second parameter, which is a cell. And the cell, if we don't provide a cell, just to be fail safe, we can use default, default values. If I don't provide a cell, it will be an asterisk. But if I do provide a cell, then I'm going to use the cell that I have taken from as an input, from as a parameter. This is the only thing that I need to do in order to build a full row with any kind of character. It can be a cell, uh, it can be made of asterisks, or it can be made of anything else. And in this case, build full row can be used in my build full rectangle, not with just one parameter. It can be used with another parameter, the cell. But do I know what cell I want? Uh, yes, if I do, I can say I want an asterisk or I want uh, the hash symbol or I can use whatever I want. But still, this value is hard coded in the function build full rectangle. Maybe I want to give the user the ability to build a full rectangle by providing the number of rows, the number of columns, and also the shape of a cell. So I can say cell, which by default can still be an asterisk if I want, and I can provide the cell. So as you can see, I'm bubbling up this hard-coded variable up in the hierarchy of the functions. So in the end, the user can call this function build full rectangle by providing optionally an extra parameter that will uh, that will allow me to create the shape that I want. So I'm going to copy all of this, but still I have to not console log. So let me copy again. What happens if I copy all this code in my Node.js environment? Okay, nothing happened, of course, because I just declared functions, but now I can use those functions. What if, what happens if I console log build full, ooh, build full rectangle given two parameters, the number of rows and the number of columns? Nothing changed. Because if I don't provide the third parameter, the cell, by default, the cell is still an asterisk. But now I can provide a third parameter, which is maybe a hash symbol. And voila, I've got a completely different rectangle made with hash symbol. Or the probably Angelo's favorite is the one with question marks, because I believe he's quite puzzled by the speed of execution today. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Uh, Next time, I will go much slower. Um, now I got this pace and I can't seem to, to be able to stop. <laughs> but as you can see, you can, once you define this function, you can start making them more parametric. You can start making them uh, more lively because you can always add some more parameters and the functions will be more generic so you can reuse them uh, in multiple ways. And of course, since I created all of this, I can also do the same for the empty rectangle. So build empty row has these asterisks hard coded. And again, I can add this new parameter called cell, which by default can still be an asterisk. So if I don't provide a cell, it's not going to just break. It's still going to have the, the, com the usual uh, behavior. But instead of doing these asterisks, I'm using this parameter cell. And when I do uh, build middle rows, mi build middle rows uses build empty row. So again, I have to bubble up this asterisk so I'm able to customize all the middle rows with any cell shape that I want. And now that I have build middle rows, I can do the same in build empty rectangle. In fact, here I can provide a third optional parameter and I can use this optional parameter to build a full row with a proper cell shape and to build the middle row with the same shape. I'm going to copy everything again. And I'm going to paste it here. 
And now I can try to console log the build empty row, uh, build empty rectangle, and see what happens. So if I create an empty rectangle of 5 by 7 without specifying the cell shape, it's like this, nothing new. But if I provide another shape, like the question mark, then it's an empty rectangle made with question marks. And maybe this is not even one character, it can be Angelo Space. Ah, uh, it doesn't look really good. Why doesn't it look really good? Because the full row became Angelo, but the empty row is still a space. Mm, not really good. So maybe we have to parameterize also the empty space in order to uh, behave exactly the same as, uh, well, to have at least the same number of characters of uh, the, the full row. But I'm not going to go that way. Let's go with, the, with a basic, I don't know, let's do dollars or euros because I'm European. And this is an empty rectangle made with euros. Money, money, okay? So, as you can see, it was really, really easy to change slightly the behavior of my problem by splitting it into multiple sub-problems, each one solved independently, and each one being a little more customizable. There's only one problem left in all of this code. The problem is this comment here. I probably already told you one thing about this, but code never lies, comments sometimes, sometimes do. This is a famous quote by Ron Jeffries, and I completely agree. Code never lies, because what you write in code is exactly what is going to be executed by the JavaScript interpreter, but comments are discarded or ignored by the JavaScript interpreter and they are read only by you. So if you read again this thing here, this comment says that this will build a row made of columns asterisks and it requires only one parameter which is called columns. <coughs> Sorry, this is now false because this accepts actually two parameters, also the cell which is optional, but it's not building a row of asterisks. It's a uh, building a row made of uh, any character. So we have to change this comment, any character uh, asterisks by default and uh, how many in the number of columns. I, I don't know how to say that. It's actually pretty difficult for me to explain things in, in plain English. Now, the comment is pretty bad because it's also going into... It's, it's forcing me to scroll horizontally, so I'm going to a new line. I can do this with the, these docs. And this param here, too, is, is false because I have to add a second param. And I actually don't remember or don't know how to write these params. So I'm going to recreate the comment by itself. Okay, it's going just param cell. Okay, so in this case, I have to say param and... Here I have to say the type of the cell, and the type of the cell is probably a string. But I also would like to say that this cell is a string that I can that is optional. And I don't remember how to do this, but it's probably saying something like this: shape of the cell defaults to asterisk. Let's see what happens if I hover. Yeah, so if I write any text, as you can see. Param cell is the shape of the cell and defaults to asterisk. And you can see cell has a question mark in it, which means that this parameter is optional and it should be a string. So these comments provide you some good documentation on how to use this function. It's not really useful here. It is useful as soon as you need this function. For example, here below, I'm using this function. And if I don't remember how to use this function, what it does, I can just hover on the name and I can see documentation for what this function does. So having these comments is pretty handful, but comments sometimes lie. So I have to, if I want to write comments, I need to make sure that the comments reflect the current behavior of my functions. 
And having a comment that doesn't exactly reflect the behavior of my function is actually more dangerous than not having this, this comment. Because if the comment lies and I use this function and it gives me a completely different result, then I'm, I feel tricked. Uh, I'm starting to use a function in a, in a way, thinking that it will behave in a certain way and it's behaving completely different. It's not going to work. So, bottom line, there are two philosophies out there and already mentioned this. There are people who say that you should always comment your code. And I'm not saying that I don't agree with them. It's a style of coding. You should always comment your code because this way your code is more readable, is more maintainable, it's, it's more readable, it's, more, it's clear, it's clean, it's concise, etc. Et but there's another philosophy to which I must confess I belong to, which says that if your code is written in a clean way, then you probably don't even need any comments. Uh, well, these comments are quite useful because they give a hint on uh, the type of these uh, inputs. It doesn't give any uh, hint on the output, but I think that you can do something like return string the, let's say, the full row. I think you can write something like this and you will have also the return type. So it, it's giving you th that it's a string and it's the full row. Uh, I didn't put this return string and the editor was so smart to understand by itself what was the return type by checking that the full row that is returned was built as a string. So there, was, there is already some help from the editor. But if you really care about these types, instead of relying on these comments, which could lie, you probably want to write your code in a different language. JavaScript is a dynamic language, which means that the types are not uh, stated explicitly. S they are usually inferred, so they are deducted from the code. For example, the editor understood that full row is a string, but not because I told him, but because the editor analyzed the code and found out that full row is a string. But it's much more difficult to understand what the type of columns is. I don't know what happens if I remove all of this. If I do this, build full row accepts columns which can be anything. And if I really want the columns to be described as a number, then I can, yes, I can add a type here, uh, the, 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 the param comment, special comment here, but it could lie. Or I can use another kind of language, which is not JavaScript, maybe it's TypeScript, which allows me to add the type like this. This is valid TypeScript language, uh, TypeScript syntax, but it's not valid JavaScript syntax. And since I'm using JavaScript, this is actually wrong. JavaScript doesn't have this syntax um, in their language, so I'm going to strip away. So, bottom line, you can use comments. Comments will describe even better what your function is supposed to do. We'll probably be able to describe what is the expected input, what is the expected output, but in some cases, for example, in this case, you probably can even not write comments if your function was written correctly and also if you write tests. We haven't, uh, we haven't written tests so far. In order to write tests, you have to uh, use a testing library. And maybe one day we will do this. And I can show you that once you build your functions with the proper names, with the proper boundaries, with the proper inputs and outputs, and you write the proper tests, then comments become a little redundant. You don't really need them. But of course, they make no harm if you write them correctly and if you maintain them correctly. So please comment your code, especially now, because it's a good exercise. And then you will decide, or your team will decide, if you really want to go with comments or not. And that's all I had to say about functions, that th there's only one thing left to say, which I think is descri described in here too. Oh, functions is equal to comments. And it shows you how this thing behaves with the show primes um, function. So, very good read. 
Okay, it doesn't say anything about another important feature about function declarations, and I'm going to tell you right now. Function declarations are subject to a phenomenon called hoisting. And hoisting is something that I already mentioned some time ago. It's a good thing in, with functions, and it's a bad thing with variables. Why are we not using the var keyword? Because it declares variables that are subject to hoisting. Well, and we don't want that. But we like having hoisting applied on our functions. And why is that? Because hoisting means that even if you declare a function at the bottom, JavaScript interprets it just like it was declared at the top of our code. Bobby says some of us are still using the var keyword and that's fine, that's fine. At a certain point you will find out that you don't want to use the var keyword anymore because it's more of a nuisance than anything else. Also because it's subject to hoisting. Uh, while functions are, the, the fact that functions are subject to hoisting is actually a good thing. So let's see new file, 0 2 hoisting, let's say function hoisting because we care about this. Now in this file, since uh, we are already almost over, I'm just going to copy and paste all the code that I have here, but in a different, uh, in, in a different order. I'm starting with, uh, I'm starting with these variables. And I can start right away saying uh, build, what do we have here? Build full rectangle. given rows and columns. And this is the invocation. I'm invoking the function even before I declared it. Now I can declare it. And then once I declare it, I need also build full row to make everything work. So I'm going to copy also build full row. And I don't care about the comments actually. Okay, and then build full row doesn't depend on any other function. So I'm fine with that. So what did I do? I just changed the order in which I want to read this solution. First of all, I'm getting the input from the user and I'm executing something. And then I'm explaining what is this buildful rectangle. But buildful rectangle uh, depends on the ability to build a full row. So how to build a full row? I see it right on the bottom. As you can see, this code looks like a, a bit like a newspaper article. I see the headline, the main headline, and I immediately know, starting from line four, but of course I can do it even on line one. Starting from line one, I know what this code is going to do. This code is going to build a full rectangle. And I can stop here. Otherwise, I can ask myself, hey, how to build a full rectangle? And I can go look at this function here, which will explain me how to build a full rectangle. And the full rectangle is about concatenating uh, for every row a build the result of doing build full row. Do I really need to care about what is how to build a full row? Yes, then I will read below. A newspaper article is usually shaped like this. You have the headline, and if you're interested in more, you can look at the second headline. And if you're interested in even more, you can go into the body of the article and read everything explained thoroughly. But it's up to you to decide where, what you want to read. You can stop here and not care about the implementation details, or you can stop in the middle, uh, understanding how to build a full rectangle and not caring about the details on how to build a full rectangle, or you want to know everything and then you will open everything. This code works because functions are hoisted. Even though I'm using this function after I, mean, I invoked it, well, JavaScript makes it possible that you can write it like this and JavaScript will interpret it as the function was declared before it was used. Which is really convenient because it allows you to write your code as a newspaper article. Angelo, can we have the risk of getting in an error circular reference? Not sure it's called like that. I only know it from Excel. Yes, you can incur in this problem. The problem here is called, well, it's not a problem. It's a, another phenomenon which is called recursion. 
and you can incur in an infinite recursion which is very similar to an infinite loop in an infinite loop you start looping and you end not never in an in a recursion you have a function that invokes itself or maybe it invokes another function which invokes the the first function in the first place and in that case you will have an in, an eternal loop of functions invoking other functions or invoking themselves so yes recursion is one of the topics that we will cover towards the end and if you don't pay attention on how to write your, how to write your functions the recursion will be infinite and you will have you will incur in an error which is called a stack overflow which not surprisingly is also the name of the most famous website in which you can find answers to your coding problems there's this website called stack overflow we probably stumbled upon it sometime and stack overflow is named mainly because of this huge problem that we usually have when dealing with uh, uh, functions invoking other functions or yeah cold stacks and i think that's it for today there's already a lot so first of all please read all the documentation here and uh, read the summary do the tasks we are going to do these tasks together uh, next wednesday if you have time please also do some homework and the homework is all about re-reading all the code that we've done so far and try to refactor it with functions or maybe even better you can recreate uh, resolve the problem from scratch trying to not remember what you've done and but solving it through functions what i suggest to you uh, what i really suggest you to do is to read the uh, the requirements read the hints and the hints are also a hint on how to solve to split the problem into multiple sub problems so split the problem into multiple sub functions that you can combine together so this happens with the the full rectangle the empty rectangle but it also applies to any other problem um, for example well here you can probably solve independently the problem of how to build the current row given the, the the index of the current row or something like that so there's always a way to solve these problems especially the huge ones into small functions small atomic modular functions that can be combined together then you will see you will probably start appreciating the the beauty the power of functions a very simple construct but it has so much power and of course functions will be used throughout all the lessons and throughout all your IT career uh, hopefully and that's it for today thanks a lot uh, if you have any doubts please feel free to, to write on discord uh, feel free to reach out to me in private in public I'm always available as always but in the meantime have a good Saturday and remember to eat pasta code faster bye <laughs>